a very good morning to everyone, uh, respected, esteemed resource persons, uh, chairperson, deputy chairperson, and the coordinators of this workshop, including the esteemed participants. I, Mr. Prasenjit Brokakoti, Joint Organizing Secretary of this national workshop, welcome you all to this last day session. I am very delighted to introduce Professor Dr. T. Ramakrishnan sir as the invited resource person for today's technical session on overview on trademark law. Professor Dr. T. Ramakrishnan is a professor of law and chair professor of intellectual property rights at the prestigious National Law School of India University, Bangalore, which is ranked to be the most which is, uh, which is ranked to be the topmost law college by the Indian uh, National Institution Ranking Framework in 2020. Professor Ramakrishnan did his graduation and post-graduation in law with specialization in international law and jurisprudence and thereafter a master degree in political science and public administration. He has been awarded doctorate for his research legal protection of well-known trademark. In addition to this, he also have a postgraduate diploma in criminology and administration of criminal justice to his credit. Professor Ramakrishnan acted as chairperson, resource person, and invited speakers in various conferences, seminars, and workshops, among which a few of them are International Convention of on intellectual property rights, national conference on trips and its implications, national seminar on contemporary issue in trademark law organized by patent, copyright and trademark owners association, emerging trend in copyright organized by the Ministry of HRD, Government of India, faculty development program on intellectual property rights, especially for the engineering faculty members, refresher course on intellectual property rights and human rights, WIPO SARC expert body workshop on intellectual property, traditional knowledge, and generic genetic resources, conference on copyright enforcement, symposium on WTO and its implications, and many more. Professor Ramakrishnan has authored a number of modules for postgraduate diploma course on intellectual property rights, among which a few of them are introduction and basic concept of in intellectual property rights, acquisition and enforcement of intellectual property rights, information technology related intellectual property rights, biotechnology related intellectual property rights. Professor Ramakrishnan is a brilliant researcher and had undertook various funded and non-funded research projects uh, such as research for the Justice Malimath Committee on reform to the criminal justice system which is well known to all the law fraternity members. Ne secondly, project on globalization and the international governance of modern biotechnology. IUCN project working on a project sponsored by the IUN born on intellectual property strategies for a successful biotech, biotech industry. Worked with government of Karnataka, labor department on policy related child labor officers, investigating officers, etc. Government of India project on impact of outsourcing on of clin uh, clinical trials to India and Ministry of HRD funded traditional knowledge protection. So this is not actually the end of his profile. If I go on saying it will be a never ending profile actually. And so <laughs> with this lot of experience, we hope that we'll be learning a lot from him. So, sir, I request you to take over the session. Uh, kindly permit me to uh, share with you the PowerPoint presentation. I hope this PowerPoint presentation will have uh, definitely point as well as the power in it. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you see that? Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. Yeah. So, law of trademark. Let me just start my presentation with 
the functions of trademark. And so what are the functions of trademark? Before I move to the functions of trademark, I am interested in quoting Justice Frankfurter, who in uh, the famous case of Vishawaka Rubber and Woolen Manufacturing Company versus SS Chris, he said, so what a trademark is. Trademark is a merchandising shortcut which induces a purchaser to select what he wants or what he has been led to believe he wants. So the purchaser, the consumer as you call it, he wants certain things and he has been led to believe that there are certain products which are good for him. So the trademark is a merchandising shortcut and that induces the purchaser to Purchase it. He, look at it from the owner's perspective. The owner of a mark exploits this human propensity by making every effort to impregnate the atmosphere of the market with the drawing power of a congenial symbol. So the market here is impregnated, right, uh, with this particular symbol. What is the symbol here? The protection of trademark is the loss recognition of the psychological function of the symbols. So the psychological function of symbol is that it takes you to a particular product, it takes you to a particular service, it takes you to a particular organization. See the moment you see olive leaves, right, immediately are reminded of peace and security. The moment you think of the bald eagle, you are reminded of the United States. The moment you are looking at blind goddess, you are led to the uh, scales of justice. So, which means symbols have that particular power, the psychological function they have. And what you find in trademark is the psychological function of the symbols. Shakespeare, I am sure you might have read Romeo and Juliet. Through Juliet, he says, what is there in a name? By whatever name you call rose, right, it has the same fragrance. Whether you call it jasmine, whether you call it any name, but the rose will have its own fragrance. So that is what he was saying as to what is there in a name. Well, friends, that doesn't apply to the trademark law. There is everything in a name. There is everything in the logo that you are going to select for your product. And that's the uh, power of the trademark. What are the functions of the trademark? The four functions of the trademark are, one is identification, second is source, third is quality, and the fourth advertising symbol. These are the four functions of a trademark. Just have a look at each function. Number one is to identify one seller's goods and distinguish them from goods sold by others. Second one, to signify that all goods bearing the trademark come from or are controlled by a single source. Signify that all goods bearing trademark are of an equal level of quality. And finally, as a prime instrument in advertising the and selling the goods. Let me just pick up one, the first one. Identification. Trademark is an identifying symbol. Fine. I have always told my students that there is a very, very simple way of understanding the trademark, and this has been acknowledged by the acknowledged writers in trademark law throughout the world. Just two questions Who are you? What are you? Right? You just stand in front of your laptop and ask the question, who are you? What would be the answer that you're going to get? I'm sure it will say, I am HP, I am Apple, so on, so on, so forth. Stand before refrigerator and ask the question. Stand before the TV and ask the question, who are you? So all these, it will say, Sony, etc., etc. 
Ask the question, what are you? It starts describing its nature. It says, I am a laptop with all these features. I am a TV with all these features. I am a refrigerator with all these features. Ask an individual only. Ask our host, who are you? She will say, I am Preeta Brahma. What are you? She starts explaining, sir, I am a professor, I am so and so, I have been organizing this program. Ask Prasanji also, he also would say, My, I am Prasanji. What are the different friends here? This particular no. two questions, it's a merchandising shortcut. Okay, how the psychological function of symbols function in the trademark era? And he said, the protection of trademark is the loss recognition of the psychological function of the symbols. That is where I told you that the bald eagle, the blind goddess, the dove, See, these are the symbols. And I will come to the symbols and the trademark law a little later. So this is the importance of the symbols and therefore both the consumer as well as the proprietor of the product would be able to gain to the trademark protection. And this is where I had moved to the four function. I think you can see that. Prasenji, please coordinate with me. Yes, sir. And keep telling me whenever it stops. Okay, okay, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, identification source, quality and advertising symbol. And this is what I was discussing now. Trademark answers the question, who are you? And not, what are you? The moment the answer to the question, who are you, gets transformed to the answer to the question, what are you, it loses trademark. Or vice versa also. As long as it is answering the question, what are you, it would not become trademark. And the moment it starts answering the question, who are you, it gains the trademark status. What is that? That is called as acquisition of secondary meaning by a particular word. Now tomorrow, now tomorrow, let me just pick up one particular name from the region, your region itself. Let me just pick up the surname of Rita, Brahma. The moment you use the word Brahma, it might refer to Preeta Brahma or our Lord Brahma. Right? And now I just modify that particular thing and start production of a uh, technical gadget. And the technical gadget now I would like to call it by the name Brahma but with a suffix. Not Brahma as is. Now people initially would say, this is the name of an individual, name of the God. But when the product is marketed, people start relating that particular name to the product and not to the Lord Brahma, whenever the question of product comes up. Like Harley and Davidson. Harley is the name of an individual, Davidson is the name of an individual. Both of them come together and today if I ask you the question, Harley Davidson, I don't think any one of you would identify an individual, would identify the motorbike. There were two persons who friends in the engineering college. One a dropout, a wealthy man, and another a brilliant scholar. After four years after graduation, they meet on the streets of London and they exchange pleasantries and ask inquire about each other. And the first person says, Yeah, I was a brilliant man, I graduated with distinction, but I am not getting a good job that I deserve. And the second person says, I was not interested in continuing there, but I have so much money to invest. I do not know what to invest on. Both of them took a decision on that particular day and started a project. And after four years, rolled out a car. The most popular car in the world, Rolls Royce. Rolls and Royce were friends. The names of these two persons have become the trademark. Right? So like that. The, like that, from what are you, it could become who are you. From who are you also, it can become what are you. For example, cellophane. Cellophane initially was the brand name for a particular product. But over a period of time, cellophane became a product name, generic. Aspirin, I'm sure you have heard of aspirin. Aspirin 
was the name for a particular product, heating product manufactured by Bayer. But it became so integrated with the product itself that whenever there was a headache, people in America asked for aspirin, whether it's manufactured by Bayer or by any of these person. So aspirin became generic and it was Justice Learned Hand in the Supreme Court of US who declared and said this is no more to, to be used as the trademark. So it becomes generic. Walkman has become generic. Dada has become generic. And see the fate of Xerox. What would happen to Xerox? Xerox was answering the question, who are you? And now ask any question, including the trademark office. They say, please submit 10 sets of Xerox copies to the office. Xerox cannot be used as photocopies. And Xerox has been trying to protect it. I'll come to that and explain you as we move on. So this is the French the things right said. Who are you to be answered? And therefore, product identification is the basic function of the trademark law. Trademark does not disclose the name of its owner, but it says that, that there is a common source. Similarly, source function also. Wherever the Pepsi Cola bottle is bottled, it is done in different parts of our country. But the moment we purchase Coca Cola, we say it has a common source. Right? Even it would be anonymous sometimes. How many of us know as to what are the different products of Hindustan flavor? We just purchase them. How many of us know that this is the company which manufactures all the different products? We just know by the name of the product itself. Similarly, the next one. Today, I have consumed a particular beverage, a soft drink I have consumed in Bangalore, imagine. And tomorrow I move to Gauhati. And in Gauhati, I want to have the same taste. I know the brand name. I go and ask for that particular product with the brand name. What is the, what is the uh, felt quality? What is the expected quality? I would expect the same quality as I have felt when, when I drank it in, the, in Bangalore. What is the trademark that, what is the function that the trademark is serving here? Trademark is serving the function of consistency in the quality. If I buy that particular product of a particular brand, I am going to get the same quality which I have experienced now. So that is the quality function that the trademark serves. And next one is, it is an advertising symbol. Well, friends, with that, I am going to take you through a very interesting development that is how the brand awareness happened. Initially, all of us know that there are hundreds and hundreds of brands. In fact, uh, I was planning to take the entire audience through a quiz, a sort of quiz for five minutes where I wanted you to identify certain brands with a particular product. But that would take a little time. Let me see if that happens at the end, you can try that and then involve all of you. So when you know there is brand awareness, but brand awareness is just awareness. How many of us would prefer all the brands that we have that are there? Next comes the high degree of brand acceptability. We will say that these are the brands which we would want to. Not all the brands that are there in the world. After that, see, I, 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 I know about uh, all the popular brands of car, but I also know my purse. I would not go for all the brands, right? I may be happy with whatever brand that I can afford to. See, the next one which comes here is there are brands that enjoy a high degree of brand preference from awareness, acceptability, and then preference. Just ask some of the women about the perfume. They would say, we would not go for any other perfume other than X, Y, Z. I do not know what those X, Y, Z are. But X, Y, Z perfumes, they would say, only this, if it is not available, nothing else. That is the last stage in the brand thing, and that is where the that is where the uh, goodwill is generated. It is a brand loyalty. So people with brand loyalty 
are the people who are generating goodwill for a particular product. Then friends, in the entire, before you understand the entire trademark law, I would say that you must know the spectrum of distinctiveness. This is the basic, if you are a teacher also you should know this and otherwise also you should know this particular uh, spectrum of distinctiveness. We call it as Abercrombie test. Abercrombie test developed in US. What is Abercrombie test? It's, it's the spectrum of distinctiveness. Marks are divided into three categories. One is inherently distinctive mark, second non inherently distinctive mark, and the third one mark without any distinctiveness. This is particularly applicable to the world mark. First case, marks which are inherently distinctive. There, there is no need for any secondary meaning, which means those marks automatically qualify for protection as a trademark. They become trademarks. Second one, non inherently distinctive marks. They are not inherently distinctive, but they qualify for the trademark uh, by acquiring the secondary meaning. The third category is mark with no trademark significance. The generic mark. The generic mark will never become a trademark. Something like calling laptop a laptop, calling bottle a bottle, calling fridge a fridge would never become a trademark. Let me just come to the first part of it. Inherently distinctive marks. There are three categories that have been recognized here fanciful marks, arbitrary marks, and suggestive marks. Fanciful marks. What are fanciful marks? Fanciful marks are marks which are created exclusively for the purpose of being used on a particular product. They are created for that purpose and they become fanciful marks. Fanciful marks are always invented marks or words which are not in common use. I have given you a list of marks here Kodak, Kutikira, Kutex, Algoril, Kotex, Odal, Polaroid. They were all created or invented for the purpose of being used with respect to those products. But there is, as I told you, danger with this fanciful mark also. Right? What is the danger? The danger is they get associated with the product so intim intimately that, that it might lose the trademark status over a period of time. I was telling you about Xerox. I just wanted you to watch this. See how Xerox is trying to safeguard its own trademark. It says, you can't Xerox a Xerox on a Xerox. But we don't mind at all if you copy a copy on a Xerox copier. In fact, we prefer it. Because the Xerox trademark should only identify products made by us. Like Xerox copiers, printers, fax machines, software and multifunctional machines. As a trademark, the term Xerox should always be used as an adjective followed by whatever it is. Right? So which means you shall not use it as a Xerox. You use it as a photocopying on Xerox photocopier. Retain that. And there is one more advertisement, very interesting advertisement that comes up from Xerox. Xerox says, I told you about aspirin, right? Aspirin is generic. And Xerox comes up with an advertisement saying that please do not use the word Xerox in the same way you use aspirin. The next part is very interesting. It says, if you use the word Xerox in the same way you use aspirin, we get headache. Right? So, through that, they are trying to retain the trademark status for their product. Well, friends, arbitrary marks are there. Arbitrary marks are marks which have primary meaning, like with Happy Bhavan, like cycle, 7 o'clock, or apple, they have all have the primary meaning. But when applied to the product, they are applied arbitrarily in the sense they do not have any connection with the nature of the product. They are, those are arbitrary marks. They also qualify for uh, trademark and they are the uh, marks which are inherently distinctive. Like the example that I have given here, apple, black and white ice cream, mountain, camel and shell. Well friends, 
suggestive marks is an interesting mark interesting mark in case of suggestive marks these are the examples but i'll go and explain you as a proceed suggestive marks are marks where the consumer will not be able to relate it directly to the product but there needs a little bit of imagination imagination and then he will be able to identify that with the product not directly and those suggestive marks are also considered to be inherently distinctive marks can you just make out what this particular thing is you see the hound right and the shoes they get called as hush puppy why did it why did it become hush puppies what is the background for that when i ask this particular question people say yes sir see the smoothness of that particular dog and the shoes are also as smooth as the dog is and therefore it should be called as hush puppies but very interesting background is there i am going to show you that particular interesting background now just see here it's a slice of americana there was a new but unnamed line of men's and women's comfortable shoes made by wolverine company they did not have any specific name for that and it was jim muir who was given the responsibility of finding a name for that he was traveling in tennessee and when he was traveling in tennessee he was asked by his friend to accompany him for dinner it was a catfish dinner along with catfish the friend served hush puppies corn fried corn meal duff balls these were called as hush puppies and the friend was very very curious i keep telling this is a sales manager you know the functions of a sales manager qualities of a sales manager sales manager should be one who should be able to sell a coom coom to a bald man right this jim muir was a very very talkative man he was so talkative that he did not stop even when he was having his catfish dinner and he kept on asking he asked his friend what why do you call it hash puppies his friend was very very hesitant you know why he was hesitant because this man is so talkative and just see here you will understand as to why he was hesitant when you look at ants sir he said why hash puppies farmers use them to quiet their barking dogs was this friend jim muir barking at a particular time no this this jim muir jumped with joy jumped with joy and said well i have found a name for my shoes the expression barking dogs was used for tired sore feet in america this is also an idiom in english and that is when this particular uh, product became hush puppies why hush puppies if those hash puppies are for the barking dogs for the tired sore feet our shoes and therefore it became hash puppies and that is a suggestive mark friends suggestive marks are as inherently distinctive as the uh, arbitrary marks and fanciful marks are these are some of the examples for suggestive marks i hope dq grill and chill or crayola of our crayons and i was telling you as to what have become generic and water likely to become generic kerosene is no more a trademark aspirin is no more a trademark xerox might see the particular end if it does not contain the generic side the last one is the descriptive marks descriptive mark for example cafe cafe is a descriptive mark coffee is a descriptive mark day is a descriptive mark but today if you ask about cafe coffee day i don't think anyone would describe it in the uh, giving it the primary meaning they would straight away refer to the coffee day as a trademark right bikaner bikaner is a place but bikaner wala has become a trademark so like that these descriptive marks are capable of becoming trademarks in the acquiring secondary meaning generic terms generic terms can never become trademark the names of the product itself is antithesis of the mark so the term generic and trademark are mutually exclusive why they should be excluded the answer is a public policy one generic names are regarded with the law to be free for all for use all of us should use that right these are some of the names of the generic one which can never become a trademark 
well friends to conclude this particular part an apple for computers is arbitrary apple a day for vitamin tablets becomes suggestive tom apple for combination of tomato and apple juice is descriptive and the last one apple for apple is generic this is briefly about the spectrum of distinctiveness let me just tell you as to what are what is the definition of a trademark and then i'll take you through other interesting part what is a trademark how is it defined in the trademark act see this is the definition of a trademark a mark capable of being represented graphically and capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one person from those of others so basically it should be a mark it should be capable of being represented graphically and to capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one person from others i have already referred to the second part distinctiveness i have already referred to that the first one is it should be capable of being represented graphically and there the problem comes with respect to non traditional marks i'm going to explain you as a process and it includes shape of goods their packaging and combination of colors so what is a mark i'm just going to explain as what a mark is device or a pictorial representation become the mark all these are examples of device or a pictorial representation then a label can become a trademark these are all examples of labels a ticket can become a trademark a ticket is something which is loosely attached to the product it can become a trademark levis is an example for uh, a ticket not the name the word here but the way it is attached to the product it's also a trademark then comes the question can there be a name becoming a trademark yes in 99% of the cases it's the name of individual as a company or a firm which has become the trademark kellos kar tata maruti suzuki harley davidson cadbury so on and so forth all of them are names rolls royce avery murati kellos kar harley davidson cadbury they are all and neil giris is the name of a place also has become a trademark signature can become a trademark these are examples of signature becoming a trademark and invented words these are all, some of them are invented words like bovril whiskier wetmas dastic etc but tonic preparations for libron for tonic preparations considered to be not invented kusikin for cats not invented insti for incentive not invented there are descriptive marks for example safo safo for cleaning powder or satin in for laundry lodge sar sar can never become a trademark the name of a person place or things i have already given you examples of that personal name these are the examples haldiram hsh etc letters can become trademark like k m for mcdonald so on and so forth they all are trademarks numeral also can become a trademark right these are examples for letter becoming trademark and shape of goods packaging combination of colors and combination thereof this is what a mark means friends well with that before us there is a question i am sure i must deal with this also as a progress can sound be a trademark can smell be a trademark can color become a trademark can shape become a trademark or motion images become trademark or not these are the examples here let me just pick up the first question as to whether a sound can become a trademark at all friends please listen to the sound if you can hear them and identify if anyone can identify quickly we can respond i'm putting it again beginning i'm sure he will not respond see this is an user thank you yeah thank you this is atnt Man, who's that cat coming down? I don't know. Excellent song. Who's that cat? Who's the man with the phone? You don't have an example call. Presenting. Can you hear? 
Yes, sir. This is for Harlem Globe Trotters. I am sure the entire audience will be able to identify this. Uh, Intel. Yeah. This is MGM Roar of the Lion. Nokia. Oh. Yeah. Oh. What it is? Oh. Oh. This is Pillsbury. Twenty century pop. Yeah, see, for, uh, if you're going to describe that by name, you face the problem. I don't know how many of you will be able to identify the sound mark with this particular description. Semi long sound in the chest, register, etc., etc. Et but the easiest way to identify them is to the sound itself. This is the uh, Tarzan yell. Yeah, somehow it's not working. Uh, Harley Davidson, right? The sound of Harley Davidson was claimed as a trademark. It gives a sound, potato, 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 so sound. And that was claimed by describing the mark in this particular way. They said the mark consists of exhaust sound of applications of motorcycles. Products produced by V-Twin Common Cramping Engine and Joseph Bonk, the HD attorney, he described this in this way. Design results in a syncopated, uneven, idle, which when simulated verbally sounds like potato, potato, potato. My friends, the question before us is, does it become a trademark? Right? These are the things to be satisfied here. Number one, it should be a symbol. Number two, it should acquire a secondary meaning. Number three, it should overcome functionality doctrine. Only then it can qualify as a trademark. And in this particular case, the uh, Harley Davidson, if compared with Honda Shadow, this has been compared actually, and the sounds, right, are so distinct in these cases that that people who have heard and Admire Harley Davidson sound would not confuse it with uh, the Honda shadow. However, if people are blindfolded and asked to identify a particular sound, and if they say for every good sound, if they say it is Harley Davidson, then it is the name which has become popular and not the sound which has become popular. Now, after this, we apply this particular test to find out whether the description is a symbol or not. Acquire secondary meaning or not. Now we find that the exhaust sound is not a fixed sound and therefore cannot become a symbol. Assuming again that it is given in MP3 form, then it becomes a symbol. Then has it acquired secondary meaning? Yes, it would acquire secondary meaning if consumers blindfolded are going to identify Harley sound and distinguish that from Honda sound or any other sound. 
If not, it does not occur secondary meaning and therefore it does not pass the second test. Even if it passes the particular second test, assume for a minute. How is this particular sound produced? The sound is produced because of the function of V twin common crank twin engine design. And this is the functional part of the whole uh, bike. And if you are giving protection for the sound, exhaust sound, you are giving protection for the technology as such. So people cannot circumvent the IPRs to get another IPR. This particular sound would not be entitled for any trademark protection. How are you going to represent this particular trademark? Friends, if you lost audience, can just go to shield mark versus juice kissed case decided by the European Court of Justice and the sixth chamber concluded by saying that that uh, when you indicate that in the form of a sign consisting of notes, it will not become a graphical representation. Indications of the cry of an animal will not become a graphical representation. By onomatopoeia, without more, it will not become a graphical representation. Even sequence of musical notes is not sufficient graphical representation. And they said that the only mode of graphical representation could be right uh, by stave divided into measures and showing in particular clef, musical notes, etc. etc. You know those staves, four lines are there, and then there are clefs in each of those particular uh, uh, measures, and that is the mode of representation which can qualify for. Uh, protection of that particular mark. Well, friends, uh, can shape become, can color become trademark or not? Let me just quickly go through this particular thing. Uh, T Mobile trademarks the color magenta. They have got trademark for that. Uh, however, not all color trademarks will become uh, trademarks. In this particular case, the red and white stripes for toothpaste was not allowed because they said. Red stripes are functional in that they carried the mouthwash in the product. And red was the only limited number of colors available here. And in case of John Wyatt's color tablet, a single color was being applied to the whole surface of the drug to indicate its strength. Strength here, friends, please note here. Color in this case has been used to denote dosage rather than as a trademark. The colors yellow and blue are common in the pharmaceutical industry and could not acquire secondary meaning. For example, if you just say red tablets contain 5 mg and blue tablets will contain 15 mg. So red tablets and blue tablets, the color red and blue here are indicating the dosage and not indicating the source. Therefore, they would not become trademarks. And the Court of European Court of Justice has examined in the Edelberger case, right, as to how a color would become trademark and see on the right side what I have written here, a color combination which has not been spatially delimited is not registrable trademark because it is not sufficiently precise that competitors can see from the register exactly what is protected. If you just say two colors and you have not spatially demarcated as to how much is this color, how much is that particular color, then it is a very wide protection and therefore not be entitled for any trademark protection is what the European Court of Justice said. Red lacquered swell of Christian Robert in shoes are protected here. This is the color, it is protected. Owens Corning's pink insulation, it has got trademark protection. See here, the next is the entire thing is Owens Corning. Again, the pink is there. Uh, and even the city group bank also gives protection to that particular wave, blue and red wave. Then, friends, the question is, can shape become trademark or not? Shape can become trademark. See, the contrary bottle shape is protected. Coke bottle is protected. Jif lemon is protected. Tobler and chocolate bar, which you eat, is protected. But shape will not be registered if it results from the nature of the product themselves. For example, you claim for round shape of a tennis ball. That will not get protection. Or a trade by a, a shape which has got a technical result, like the example that I'm going to give you now. Substantial value of goods, all these would not become trademarks. See here, this is the shape of 
the Phillips shaver. Phillips shaver had this particular shape. It an equilateral triangle, and within that you find three circles. And these three circles are going to perform the function of effective shaving. This particular shape was claimed by Phillips. And Remington manufactured a similar product, and there was a suit against Remington, which goes ultimately before the European Court of Justice. Phillips versus Remington. And the European Court of Justice addresses four questions, of which the fourth question at this particular stage would be relevant for our purpose. What is the fourth question? Whether a purely functional shape is caught by the occlusion, even where it could have been shown that the same technical result could have been achieved by other shapes also. See here you have equilateral triangle, three circular rings. Imagine instead of three circular rings are placed in each angle, if there are three circular rings, one inside the other, right, ingrained like that, that's it's a different shape. When there's a different shape, should not this particular shape claimed by Philip become distinctive? So that categorically is the answer in this form. It says, it must be interpreted to mean that a sign consisting exclusively of the shape of a product is unregisterable by virtue of thereof if it is established that the essential function features of the shape are attributable only to the technical result. So you have a shape and that shape results in technical function. That's enough. It's an absolute bar. And the moment it results in technical result, that shape would get excluded from trademark protection. An interesting one. An application was filed for shape relating to sweet on sticks. You know, lollipops are they? Something like that. Relating to sweet on sticks. And the trademark office said, no, we can't grant it because it's entirely functional. What is that function? It assists the consumer to eat the product with minimum of mess. When I say mess, I'm sure you must have seen the advertisements of Cadbury, right? Mess all over the, the mouth and other places. So this assists in eating the product with minimum of mess. And therefore, it is functional, cannot get the trademark protection. In India, we have granted protection for shape of Zippo lighter, right? Friends, I think uh, uh, smell, I would just skip and then move forward. What is the procedure for registration of trademark in India? And through that, I'm going to explain you uh, some of the substantive parts of uh, grounds for refusal of trademark. Simple process that I have explained you here is an application is filed, receipts are there. Now it's all online applications. Application number allotment happens and the data entry happens, and uh, there'll be scanning for that particular thing. Then examinations will happen, examination report is dispatched, and it's either accepted or objected to. If it's accepted, then the procedure follows. If it's objected, then the person will be asked to show cause, right? If it is refused, then there can there is appeal before the intellectual property appellate board. If it is accepted, see it will be published in the journal, and then we await they await opposition. And if the opposition is there, then there will be a board constituted for hearing the opposition. And if the opposition is discarded, then the application would be accepted for registration. It goes for uh, registration process. If the opposition is upheld, then it could be appealed against, right? Either review or appeal against the Indonesian Property Board. This is very, very simple way. And uh, latest changes to the trademark rules have indicated that out of so many forms, there were more than 70 forms, they have been reduced into a minimum number of forms now. Right? That's briefly, friends, about the procedure. I did not, I, I would not spend more time on the procedure part. Well, friends, when application is filed and the examination happens, there are grounds on which trademark could be refused. And here we look into some of the law, right, which has substantive impact on that. What is that, that ground on which you're going to refuse registration? First ground is that it is not distinctive in nature. 
what is the order of distinctiveness? Like simple signs, simple letters, simple numbers, grammatical signs, or a line square or a diameter circle. If it is just that without any idiosyncratic combination, it is devoid of distinctive character and may be refused. Then, if it is descriptive in nature, for example, it indicates a kind of goods, quality of goods, intended purpose, value, geographical origin, time of production, or other characteristics of goods. For example, now, kind, quality, and quantity. You, you want to use the word extra large or large or small. Right? Don't mistake this for certain products. Uh, extra large, large or small, this cannot be a trademark. Good or best, 20 or 200 in a pack of cigarettes cannot be trademark. Treat for desert sauces or fruit loop for cereals cannot be trademarked because that indicates the quality. See, the lasting performance for perfumes, perfumes are meant to have a lasting performance and that would not become a trademark which is descriptive. And if it's intended purpose, some of the examples here are perfect grow for cosmetics. This is descriptive. Food saver for vacuum packing machine, descriptive. Kettle clean for preparations of cleaning kettles, descriptive. Slim and fit for cleaning preparations, descriptive. And if it is value, then if you just say two for one, worth their weight in gold, these cannot become trademark because they are describing the value of the product. Similarly, geographical names cannot become trademark. There are exceptions to that. Maybe we can take up at, uh, during the question asked. Magnolia for metallic permitted. Farra for cloths were permitted. However, the word Shimla, very interesting case between ITC and the trademark office, which went up to Calcutta Division Bench, uh, where the court said categorically that the word Shimla cannot be used with respect to cigarettes manufactured by the uh, ITC. Uh, one of the argument, not I'm not into all the argument. One of the argument here was, well, they, the, 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 it was a counter argument. Uh, to, to an argument which said nobody would grow tobacco in Shimla because you can't grow tobacco in Shimla and therefore this should become arbitrary and we should be permitted to use it. But the response here was, counter argument was nobody can grow tobacco but anyone can process tobacco in Shimla. Right? And therefore the name of a popular place cannot be used. Mediterranean for transport services cannot be used. Wall Street Dalal Street for financial services will become descriptive. Well, friends, exceptions could be they can acquire distinctiveness and acquire secondary meaning. When they acquire secondary meaning, they might displace the primary meaning as well. Or they may not displace the primary meaning. But you're going to look at the relevant class of persons to find out whether they can acquire distinctiveness or not. Well, friends, other absolute grounds are if it's going to deceive the public, I'm going to give you examples now. If it's going to deceive the public or cause confusion, or if it hurts the religious susceptibilities, or if it is scandalous or obscene, or if it is prohibited by emblems and names act. These are the grounds on which it can be refused to use patients. Let me just refer to you one specific case, very interesting case, Amrudhara Pharmacy and Satyadev Gupta. And this is a leading case. The uh, principles of which is still followed, adhered as a precedent. Simple issue was just like this. Satyadev Gupta filed an application for registration of what is called as Lakshman Dhara. Right? And Amrut Dhara Pharmacy had established itself right from 1903 and was selling this particular product under the name Amrut Dhara. The application with Satyadev Gupta goes around 1949 or 50. Amrudhara Pharmacy raised objection saying that there is a confusion between Amrudhara and Lakshman Dhara. Trademark office says yes, we find some confusion because the consumer is likely to get confused when he goes for a particular product. Similar products are there, sold under these, these two names. And then they went to go, go before the Calcutta High Court. Calcutta High Court judge, right, judges were not convinced with the decision of the trademark office. The 
Calcutta, Calcutta High Court judges said, well, where is the confusion? The two words, see Amrutha, see Lakshmana. And they started dissecting or dissecting this particular word Amrutha, going back to Samudra Manthana and the creation of Amrutha and how the whole thing happened. And people are very much aware of Amrutha. And similarly, they will go to Lakshmana and they say, Lakshmana is a value, right, uh, in, in Ramayana. He is known for his uh, strength, valor, and this is Amrutha and this is Lakshmana. There is no question of confusion. Registrar, you register it. Amrutha Pharmacy approached the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court had to examine this. Some of the amongst the questions, one of the questions was, who are the persons who, who the resemblance would be likely to deceive or confuse? To whom should it cause confusion? See, I have stomach pain as a consumer, or a common man has stomach pain. He wants Amrudhara. He goes to the shop and asks the shopkeeper, Mujhe Amrudhara Ejiye. And the shopkeeper may, may not have Amrudhara, he may have bought uh, Lakshmandhara. He says, Kya Lakshmandhara chalega? Imagine the position of that person before the shop asking for Amrudhara because of stomach pain. Do you think that person would now start going back to Samudra Mantana, Amrutha, going back to Ramayana, Lakshmana, and then say, yes, it's confusing. There's no confusion between the two. The moment the person hears Amrudhara and says, Lakshmandhara Chalega, whether he gets confused or not, who is that person who is going to get confused? If the person says, if you just say that, then the thing is he got confused. Who is that person? What is the standard here? And the standard has been laid down by the Supreme Court in this particular case. What is that standard, friends? That standard is, you should look at it from the point of view of an unwary purchaser with average intelligence and imperfect recollection. An unwary purchaser Average intelligence and imperfect recollection. You cannot apply the standard of an intelligent person and a person with photographic memory. And that will not be applicable to decide. This is the similarity. And this test, friends, have been reiterated by the, yeah, uh, I see President G. Uh, I this has been reiterated by the courts all through, and that is a test. And in this particular case, since the purchaser will not split the terms into component parts, and consider etymological meaning, uh, there is confusion in between the two. And the next one was what rules of comparison are to be adopted in judging whether such resemblances exist? The court says overall structural and phonetic similarity of the two terms will have to be looked into. The trademark as a whole needs to be considered and should not be split into different parts to find out the etymological meaning of each part of it. So this is the test to be applied. And by applying this test, if you find that it is likely to deceive or likely to cause confusion, then such a trademark should not be given registration. I'll just refer to some one or two uh, points on this particular section nine, and then we take a break. And after the break, we'll come back and then continue. Right? Let me just stop at an appropriate place. In Hoffman La Roche, it was a uh, medicinal product Dropovit and protovit, the court says there's no confusion because uh, there's no confusion because dropovit and protovit are two different things because wit is common. Whereas the first one, dropo and proto, they're for diff two different products and therefore there's no confusion whatsoever. And in Dyer Meekins Brewery's case, Highland Chief plus device of a Scottish soldier wearing feather bonnet. You have not used the word Scotch whiskey, but you have used the the symbol, the, the symbol of Highland Chief that refers to Scotch Whiskey Association, that is the NF2 cause confusion is what the court said. Hurting religious susceptibilities, hallelujah, right? If you use the word hallelujah, which means praise the God, song of praise to the God, should, was refused registration. And then friends, uh, let me just give an interesting part of the whole development. See here, Jaldex, is already there. Uh, Jardex, they want to register as trademark for disinfectant. 
and Jardex for extractor fluids is already in use uh, as a trademark. Yes, imagine there is no confusion, but both are likely to be used in the hospitals. Imagine a nurse has been asked to bring right, Jardex, second Jardex, the extract of meal for a particular patient, and the nurse brings the first one and administers it to the patient. The disinfectant would kill the patient in that particular thing. So it is refused. And in India, very interesting happened. Nardeline, Nardeline for stimulant. They wanted registration for Nardeline. You do, don't pronounce it as Nardelzine. Nardeline. And the second one is Nardel. Nardeline for stimulant. Already Nardel for depression is already registered. Again, again, look at the uh, hospitals where people are treated. A person who is volatile, right, who has become mad. Has been taken to the hospital. He's so volatile that he had to be contained. And now, if, if Nardel is to be given to him as depressant, and imagine in that particular stage, if Nardelin is given, he would, right, just die. And look at a person who is also already going to coma, and he needs a stimulant. Nardelin he needs, and if he's given Nardel, depressed person would further depress from coma. He go to a different world altogether. What is the problem here? The problem is that it's the goal. like if even if there's a slight, slight confusion, it is likely to lead to a disastrous consequence. It's called a disastrous consequence test, and therefore it is to be refused. In both the cases, they were refused. Last part of section nine is emblems and names prevention act has excluded all these. You can't use any one of it. You can't have a trademark in the name of Mahatma Gandhi or the Parliament or Ashoka Chakra. Or Rashtrapati Bhavan, Raj Bhavan, Bharat Scouts, Sri Sharada Mat, right, ICAO, Interpol, or any of the international organization, or even the names of the international non proprietary names. You know, recent case in the COVID context, I'll just state this and then we will take a break. In the COVID context, I'm sure you must have heard of Gilead Life Sciences. Gilead Life Sciences has patent over several products. And one of the products over which it has um, uh, patent is Remdesivir. Remdesivir is considered to be one of the effective drugs now at some stage of the treatment for COVID-19. And they have a patent from, to, 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 from uh, uh, 2015 up to 2035, they have patent protection for that particular product. Now, can they take trademark protection for the word Remdesivir? Remdesivir is a name driven by the WHO as an international non proprietary name to identify that particular chemical substance. Even Gilead cannot take trademark over that. Any other person who manufactures can have another trademark, but Remdesivir is sold as Remdesivir and a different trademark. That's the thing. And uh, that is what is excluded under the, these provisions. Well, friend, this is first part of it. What are the other interesting parties, likelihood of confusion? And then dilution part I'm going to take up in the second half. Now, friends, uh, the first set of exclusions that I refer to, they're all absolute grounds on which trademark could be refused. What I'm going to refer now, what is that, what you find on the slides? I just displayed that even before I started so that you'll be familiar with this. There are two aspects here. One is about the likelihood of confusion, right? And the second one is about unfair advantage are detrimental to distinctive character of repute or the repute of the trade trademark. So these are the two things. First one is a case relating to likelihood of confusion test, as we popularly call it. And the second one is the one which has been introduced through the 1999 uh, amendment that is uh, popularly called as the dilution. Dilution doctrine that developed in US uh, through the Federal Trademark Dilution Act. Although this particular concept had developed much earlier, back in 1923 itself, in an article written by Shetter uh, in uh, one of the journals. And Shetter had borrowed this particular idea from development that had happened in Germany, which means Germany already had this particular dilution doctrine applied. And you find almost 100 years have passed after that. Uh, and we find that reflected in our legislation. 
what is the dilution doctrine how it's applied at stress level let's uh, very very briefly i'm going to explain with this forum uh, i don't think i'll be able to get into the nitty gritties of each of these principles and the concepts first one is the identity of earlier mark similarity of goods or services similarity of earlier mark and identity of similarity of the goods or services which means there is identical or similar marks and there is identical and similar goods or services on the other hand and by virtue of that there is likelihood of confusion on the part of the public look at the second one second one marks are identical or similar but goods or services are dissimilar goods there are different goods or different services under the trademark act you have different classes of goods and services under which you have to register your trademark and you will be able to claim protection for your uh, trademark if similar trademarks or potentially similar trademarks are used with respect to those goods coming under that particular class if you look at the second part here even if people want to register it for a different goods or different services then what you have registered if your earlier mark has become a well known mark then you will be able to prevent registration of that particular mark even for dissimilar goods or dissimilar services i just would like to pick up here the infringement section also section 294 also refers to this particular dilution doctrine so if a person is using a particular mark for a certain goods or services and this particular use of goods or trademark for goods or services is resulting in they are taking unfair advantage of the well known trademark which is registered in india or which is detrimental to distinctive character of repute of that particular well known mark then it amounts to infringement and such infringement is infringement by dilution similarly if subsequently an individual uses a particular mark which is likely to cause confusion with the earlier marks then also it amounts to infringement so those two aspects i'm going to cover uh, in this particular part itself simultaneously similarity of marks some of the examples i'm going to give you here uh, you're going to look into the degree of phonetic visual or conceptual similarity always you look at the distinctive and dominant component so you're going to compare it with the distinctive and uh, dominant component just uh, have a look at the examples right sometimes you give importance to first syllable beck and eisenbeck sometimes you give refer importance to the idea underlying that the concept underlying that zinc bar and zn zinc zinc and zn they mean the same thing conceptually though literally they may not so conceptually they, are, they mean the same and therefore there could be similarity at the conceptual level as well even that will have to be decided by determining likelihood of confusion cadilla healthcare case is one of the popular cases the most important case in the entire development and it was a case between case where falsic and falsic type was there and this test laid down by previous courts has been reiterated and cadilla case establishes or reestablishes the procedure to be followed when case of infringement comes first impression is always to be judged and man of average intensity of the election laid down by satyadev uh, amrutdhara pharmacy is applicable burden of proof is always on the plaintiff durgadatt sharma's test is laid applied and diakem case was overruled by the particular court simple reason is diakem case where the case was between picnic and picnic pic nic and pik nik there was a logo of a person standing with a hat a boy standing with a hat in between pic and nic and that was not present in the second one and the court went ahead and said look, look at the dissimilarities if the dissimilarities are so much which can separate each one of them then it should not be held as is a dissimilarity that was in dikem case and the dikem case also went ahead and said there is no need for you to emphasize on the phonetic similarity cadilla healthcare case overruled that and then said dikem case is a very bad decision and we now lay down the principle the principle is first impression man of average intelligence burden is on the plaintiff 
and you are going to look at the similarities between the two and the dominant pieces between the two to determine the receptive similarity and phonetic similarity is equally important as much as visual and conceptual similarity is which cannot be ignored and the most interesting part is the argument was taken up saying that physicians and surgeons are knowledgeable but quoting McCarthy the court said they may be knowledgeable in their fields does not mean they are equally knowledgeable as to marks and that does not mean that they are not going to mistake one mark for another if you medicinal product there should be much care to be taken here the reason is uh, medicinal products are drugs are poisons and not sweets if you are eating java or if you eat jangir nothing will happen if you are eating x feet if you buy eat y feet because of the confusion nothing would happen but as i told you in the previous class right for taking stimulant if you are given the present it damages the life itself and therefore there should be more care taken in such circumstances the court laid down the factors to be considered for determining deceptive similarities and friends uh, usually the highly distinctive the earlier mark is uh, later mark will have to make minor major modifications to change and become distinctive i am just picking up one particular example here vix vapor up who does not know vix vapor vix vapor up salve and a triangle with words vix chemical company chemical company printed on that the respondent here or the defendant here also manufactured jars of ointment it was jars of ointment and they use the word kersot kersot is not vix here but they use the word vapor up also right and uh, the only word that i have used is vapor up when they were sued they took up the defense saying that that vapor up is a Uh, descriptive word. However, the court overruled that. And uh, only there are other parts like cursory and other things which distinguish from Vix. Still, the court went ahead and said the her earlier mark Vix and vapor up. Vix was associated with vapor up and vapor up with Vix, and it's so much right distinctive, which has caught the attention of the consumers that use of the word vapor up along with any other word is likely to cause confusion with the big vapor of itself and therefore they uh, granted relief to a weak chemical well friends uh, just have a look at the some of the example that i'm going to give here like rolls royce of lawn mowers lawn mowers we are manufacturing lawn mowers and they say this is rolls royce of lawn mowers our product our uh, Next to Marks and Spencers, someone in Guwahati manufactures a bike, and then calls it by a particular name, Russian G bikes. Imagine, but in the advertisement they say, "Well, this is Rolls Royce of Guwahati. Ah, uh, this is Harley Davidson of Guwahati." Can the word Harley Davidson be used or associated with the bike manufactured in Guwahati? That is where, friends, this particular. Uh, Taking undue advantage comes up. I have given you two examples here. Before that, just see here. No one can have a free right. There must be a conceptual connection between reputation and the goods in respect of which the mark is used. The bike is there. Harley Davidson word you are using, and easily it gets transferred and therefore it amounts to taking undue advantage. Selling drinks in football boot shaped bottle with a three stripe mark was there. And three stripe mark, as you know, refers Adidas, and Adidas raises objection here, and they were able to say the drinks are provided right in this in these bottles, which having the boot shape or football boot. This is sporting connection number one, and the connection in trade between the parties results in parasitic use of Adidas, and hence this is taking undue advantage. However, in the second one, they said. The reputation of Audi cannot be transferred to high technology here, right? Uh, uh, here it is, and therefore they said there is no question of undue advantage being taken. Look at this particular thing. This is the most interesting part, where the mark is used on poor quality or ineffective goods. Clarin here is used as a gene, and someone wants to use the word clarin 
in a modified way for detergent. The court says here, no one likes to be reminded of a detergent when drinking their favorite people reputation. Let me just give you an example here. Uh, out of this, this is just an example. Few assumptions you'll have to make. Maggie, the moment I use the word Maggie, what comes to your mind? I'm sure. I'm sure noodles come to your mind. And as we progress now, 12:30 or the break break. Perhaps you take noodles and then have two minutes noodles, and you may be eating also. So Maggie reminds us of noodles. Assume for a minute that Maggie has become a well-known mark. It's said to become, but as you, it has become well-known mark. And tomorrow there is an application filed before the trademark office, or there is already a, a person who is using that particular name for selling this product. What are the product for which registration is sought? Product which is being sold. Imagine, friends, if the product for which they want to use the word Maggie is not for noodles, but for toilet cleaning powder. Just think of it when you are taking. Maggie noodles, trying to eat that, you are reminded of the other Maggie. That is where it tarnishes the image of Maggie. That is what I meant here, tarnishment. It tarnishes the image of Maggie, and such a use of Maggie for different goods is prohibited by the trademark law. Right? That is that is tarnishment. I'll give you another example here of what happened in uh, UK. Someone wanted to register the word visa. They applied for visa. This is not visa for going to any other country. Now, of course, you can't go. This is not visa, financial cards, financial services. But they want a registration for the condoms. And the trademark office says, what is this? You are using it for condoms. We can't give you permission for that. We can't impose a burden. On Visa International to educate its consumers, saying that that we have nothing to do with sexual hygiene. So it's going to tarnish the image of Visa, and therefore we are not going to register this particular thing. In India, it happened once, even before we amended our legislation. Haibo Hindustan, Haibo Hindustan is part of VIP. You know VIP. We started manufacturing certain uh, uh, goods and started using the word Benz. Benz, very boldly, it used the word Benz and it used uh, a human being, three pointed human being, standing like this with legs apart uh, in, a, in a circle. If you have seen the mark of Benz, Benz is three pointed stars in a circle and the word Benz. Benz sued them for infringement. You know the difference taken up by VIP or Haibu Hindustan? It says the, the uh, Grounds of infringement should be like of confusion. Where is confusion here? What do you mean? No Indian would think that this German company manufacturing cars in Germany, the luxury cars in Germany, is coming all the way to India to manufacture undergarments. Who will confuse that? Therefore, there is no confusion whatsoever. However, the court was categorical in saying that. The word Benz has acquired distinctiveness and a very high reputation here. Using this particular mark on unsavory goods like undergarments is likely to tarnish the image and reputation of Benz. And therefore, it shall not be used anymore. So the dilution doctrine has been applied. So dilution doctrine is an important doctrine that's being applied even while rejecting an application as well as while determining Infringement. That is the point at which I wanted to make. And then trademark office has done it on several occasions. Well, friends, uh, let me just uh, procedure I have already indicated. Uh, in case of infringement, I have already told you the two examples. And uh, even when the mark is used as a trading style, a trading symbol, it also amounts to infringement. And the most interesting part is when you use it in advertisement, especially when you use other trademark and advertisement and compare the other trademark to a comparative advertisement, these problems are likely to result.
I will just give you. Uh, please have a look at this particular advertisement. Uh, this is case of comparative advertising. Never before seen commercials never aired due to their vicious nature and slanderous content. No audience has ever been allowed to witness these ads until now. Friends, the point which I wanted to, right, uh, to which I wanted to draw your attention through this, that is again a different area which requires hours to get a discussion on what is comparator treatment and when it amounts to disparagement, etc. The difference between buffer and uh, disparagement also is to be understood through so various developments in different jurisdictions. But let me just summarize the whole development here. The law related to comparative advertisement disparagement runs on these principles. Number one, I, as the proprietor of a particular product and a particular trademark, I have every right to say that my goods are the best in the world. That's buffering. 
right? Even if it is not true. Second one, I also have a right to say that my goods are better than any other goods in the world, even if it's not true. That's again another extent of property. I'll be able to compare my product with other products to say that my goods are better than other goods. However, the last principle is, I do not have any right to say that the goods of others are bad or worse. The moment I, in the course of comparative treatment, either directly or indirectly say that the goods of others are bad or worse, that amounts to disparagement. If it amounts to disparagement, it is against honest commercial practices. If the advertisement is made of another trademark, which is uh, contrary to the honest commercial practices, it amounts to trademark infringement under section 29, subsection 8 of the Trademarks Act. Even without using the trademark, if you make a comparison and leads to disparagement, it is uh, a case for uh, right, uh, civil action under the common law principles. Right? So that is the thing about comparative advertisements. Well, friends, with that background, let me just right, move to the last segment of my presentation. Although I know there are many other things that are to be discussed, which are all here very much on my slides, but still, let me just go to one particular aspect that is how because I am conscious of the time, how the trademark principles are applied in the internet context, right? And uh, if time permits, I'll take you through the common law remedy of passing off, if required. Otherwise, domain name dispute resolution issues. How do you connect trademark and domain name? And before that, what is this domain name that we have been talking of? It's an URL, Universal Resource Locator. Right, HTTP here indicates the hypertext transfer protocol. And I'm using the word NLS here. NLS.ac.in constitutes the domain name. And you know, there are two types of domain names. One is a top level domain name, like .com, .edu, so on and so forth. And then geographical top level domain names in the form of dot in dot fr dot eu etc etc well then if you want to look at the structure of the domain name and look at where nls is dot uh, in refers top level domain name which is geographical top level domain name then ac refers to the second level domain name and nls which is the key here refers to third level domain name and ww of course is the fourth one then if you want to look at it from the internet context, the whole thing, the entire internet is there. And within that broader internet, you have the country uh, top level domain names I have indicated dot in. This could be similar one also. And within that, you find again the first level domain name in the form of dot ac, dot rec, dot co, uh, dot gov, etc. etc. And ours is ac. Within that particular ac, Right, I'm taking you to the NLS. Like NLS, you have uh, other institutions also, IAC, etc., etc. And then within that, you have the server located. Right, from here it moves on, and you have the name www.nls.ac.in. From that, we are going to access to the internet. This is the domain name that we have. And what are the problems? The hierarchical structure, if you look at you find the root is there and the top level domains in the form of in and dot com are there. And then comes the second level domain name in the form of AC, CO, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, from that, you come to the specific third level domain names. The problem is always in the third level domain name because that is likely to conflict with the trademark of some other person. Let me just give you and start with an example of what this token the defendant in this case, Dennis Topin did. Dennis Topin, right, he is a notorious cyber squatter. You know who a cyber squatter is. He registers the domain name and would not allow any other person to register their uh, entitled name as a domain name. He squats on the cyberspace. He's called a cyber squatter. So he was a notorious cyber squatter. 
and you will be surprised he went and registered around 240 domain names in the domain name process package and among them were all multinational corporation names Panavision, Marks and Spencer, Cathay Pacific, all airlines, all multinational corporations he registered. And when they wanted to register, he said, I want to offer to sell it. And he said, you should pay me $13,000. So he went on demanding the premium for all these things. And Panavision, he asserted that token that uh, intention was to extort money it had, uh, since it had owned the Federal Trademark Registration. They sued them and the Federal Trademark Dilution Act. And ultimately, the Ninth Circuit went ahead and then said, the use of this particular domain name by token and registration of that has diluted the Panavision's uh, trademark, right? And it's in violation of Federal Trademark Dilution Act. It also says that involuntarily forcing a company to leave its registered trade name and reputation to the mercy of a cyber spider constitutes dilution of the trade name. So this is one particular case and series of cases have followed after that. And then card service is another which followed the case. And in UK, UK in Marks and Spencer was one in a million, where one in a million had registered similarly the name Mark and Spencer so that you could can sell it to them. The court, I just read the last part of it. The court here grants injunctive relief and it says that you are using the domain name and the domain name here that you are using to defraud Marks and Spencer uh, could be considered as an instrument of fraud. So you're using domain name as, a, as an instrument of fraud. And in India, we have this domain name and under the ministry. Nixon is regulating that. And there are several registrars for administration of this particular trade, uh, sorry, uh, domain name. The first case that came before the Delhi High Court right, uh, was uh, Yahoo versus Akash Arora. Akash Arora here. Right, uh, they registered yahooindia.com, yahooindia.com, uh, and then started using it. Yahoo Incorporated filed a suit against them for passing off. You know, they filed a suit against them for passing off because it was prior to the uh, new legislation that came into existence, Trademarks Act. Trade and Mercantile Marks Act had not provided protection for the services. Yahoo is providing services as you know, Google is providing services. So it's a service mark. And therefore, they went in for passing off action. Petitioner here contended that defendants had verbatim copied the format contains layout color scheme and the source code. And therefore, they are liable for passing off Yahoo. Though Yahoo, Akash takes up the defense that it is not Yahoo, it is Yahoo India. Separate. So disclaimer is there, but still the court goes ahead. The issues were these. Uh, can there be protection for domain name in law of trademark? Whether registration of domain name in India is relevant consideration for purpose of protection? Whether protection, if possible, would have be in the statute or whether it should be in the passing law? These are the issues that came before the court. And the court decided, like we saying, domain name has the same function as a trademark and is an instrumentality of goodwill. You can generate goodwill. And relief for passing off was allowed by the court, saying that since it's not protected under statute, passing off action is an appropriate action. And business reputation has been wrongly exploited by the respondents. And uh, they need to ensure commercial stability. And also, they said disclaimer does not absolve liability. Likelihood of deception is sufficient. And therefore, uh, relief was granted in this particular case. And after this series of cases have come before different courts, which are not required for our purpose, but uh, ultimately the Supreme Court in Satyam Infobase versus CFNet Solutions, it uh, validated the application of trademark law for uh, preventing the use of deceptively similar trademark. Right? Uh, friends, this is a case where CFNet and then CFE net.com and you see how the defendants take up a defense here they say here sifi is derived from our promoter's name salim ibrahim fazal fahid and yusuf right it would have been some other name also but they wanted to tag on and then say sifi and sifi net this indicated a malefied intention on the part of the respondents the entire set of 
passing of uh, principles were applied, which again I am not going into those details of that at this particular stage. Uh, maybe in the course of discussion we may if required, but ultimately it said that that uh, this is likely to cause deception and misrepresentation is there. Hence, right, this amounts to a case of passing off. So remedies were given. Uh, well, friends, let me just. Uh, To conclude my debate, uh, as far as uh, domain names are concerned, there is also a remedy under the ICANN that's popularly called as Uniform Dispute uh, Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy. It is applicable to disputes where the complainant asserts these following three essential elements. One where he says that it's identical or consistently similar to the trademark or service mark. Second, when he says that the domain name holder has no rights or legitimate interest in respect of domain name. And the third one is domain name has been registered and is being used in bad faith. So these three aspects will have to be established. There's confusing similarity. The domain name holder does not have any legitimate interest. And finally, it was registered and used in bad faith. What would amount to registration and use in bad faith? There are four circumstances which have been mentioned and specified in the uh, guidelines itself. Something like uh, if it's primarily used for selling, reselling, or otherwise transferring domain name for, uh, to the complainant, etc., etc., or to prevent the trademark proprietor from using it. But primarily for the purpose of disrupting the use by the, uh, by the competitor. These are considered to be registration in bad faith. If all these are proved, then it would amount to violation of the rights of the trademark proprietor and you can initiate action under the UDRP and UDRP has very very quick and fast remedy uh, and timely fashion is going to be resolved. That's friends, these are the ICANN approved UDRP providers and there are many more now in the uh, pipeline as well as functioning, it can be resolved. Let me just conclude on uh, domain name itself with a very interesting uh, anecdote. It's not an anecdote, it's a fact, uh, a case that went before the second circuit of the New York in USA. Uh, you know, PETA, PETA.com, PETA, PETA, all of us know, PETA.org was a registered one. PETA, PETA means people. Uh, for ethical treatment of anim animals, people for ethical treatment of animals, right? And uh, this PETA is also a registered trademark in quite a few countries. So someone in New York registered PETA.com and uh, made a disclaimer in the website itself. It was PETA.com and when people clicked on PETA.com and entered into the first page, that first page clearly indicated, we are not people for ethical treatment of animals. We are a different organization. You click, you have to click again. You clicked again, and the next page said, we are different, but we are PETA. What is the different PETA? They said, we are people eating tasty animals. We are people eating tasty animals. And therefore, this is our PETA. Then if you just entered into the further pages, you would find the information about the non-vegetarian dishes that are available in different parts of the world. You can click on, click on, and then go to different parts of the world. So now this particular question came before, went before the court. And the defendant argued and said, this is a parody. It's a parody. Beta is there, and we are just parodying that. Parody is a defense in trademark law as well as copyright law. Copyright law parody is very, very interesting development. I will not be touching upon copyright law. Uh, right, uh, it's a parody, they said. So what is a parody? I'm sure you must have understood by now what a parody is after having done a uh, course on copyright law. I'll just give you a simple way of explaining this. Uh, you would have seen on MTV long back, long back, a person with short, short man with a beard used to walk into the 
podium like Amitabh Bachchan and give an impression that that it is Kaunthanega Karavati. But when he came and started his questioning, right, he would again give an impression that it is question and answer session. But the question pattern and the, the look, etc., etc., it was entirely different. Audience first given get an impression that this is a program by MTV. This is they, they are reminded of Amitabh Bachchan. They are also reminded of Kaunthanega Karavati. That's the first message. And the second contradictory message is also sent simultaneously. Second contradictory message is we are not Kandanaga Karapati. This is not Amitabh Bachchan. So if two contradictory messages are sent out simultaneously, the second word could be a parody. This is what the uh, circuit court of New York said for deciding this case. Then friends, is that all the parody here? In case of parody, you are just picking up the popular portion of the popular version just to remind people about the popular version, that's all. And beyond that, you have created your own work. If you beyond that, if you have created your own work distinct from the popular work, then that would amount to a parody. And parody should be right in a very uh, positive sense. Humorous association is permitted, whereas injurious association will not be permitted. Let me just draw the distinction between these two. Someone comes out with an, uh, an advertisement. An advertisement says, if you just look at the advertisement, you are reminded of Coca-Cola's advertisement. You have seen, enjoy Coca-Cola with all those drawings. And this person who comes out with this particular same background, he writes the word enjoy, and below instead of Coca-Cola, he writes cocaine. Enjoy cocaine. That's an injurious association. It is not a humorous association. Right? On the other hand, you have heard about the doesn't know Barbie, right? Barbie is a trademark. The Barbie moved from France to uh, US and has become a household of uh, US. Barbie, MCA company, another recording company, it comes out with a uh, an audio, with a, with a music uh, album. I am sure most of you would have heard about this. Uh, I am not a good singer, but still, to make uh, you remind of that particular song. This is how it runs. I am a baby girl. Right? You must have heard about this. I am a baby girl, and that continues. So, just concluding there, there are many yes, other yes. issues we can take up. But uh, just to conclude on this particular thing, the second circuit said, yes. uh, well, uh, there is something called as initial interest confusion. What is that initial interest confusion? A person looks at www.peter.com org www.peter.com and at the stage of clicking in on that particular URL, is there a confusion? Yes, Peter and Peter are confusingly similar. And he gets into that particular web page and then realizes that this is either for him and then continues there if he's a uh, if he's a person eating tasty animals, or if he wanted Peter, he would come back and then go to another Peter. So there's a confusion. That initial interest confusion is a confusion. And therefore, that domain name peter.com cannot coexist with peter.org. It's confusingly similar. And then it was removed. And now you can't search for uh, right, people eating tasty animals under that particular name at all. It's in a different name. That is just to highlight the fact that it is, the, it is uh, uh, a parody. Parody could be a defense, both in case of corporate as well as in case of trademark. And as far as copyright is concerned, the popular uh, uh, right, uh, uh, case, Campbell case is there in the uh, US, and, uh, and there are a series of other cases that came subsequently. Well, uh, let me just stop at this particular stage and we take up any questions and any debate that uh, I can uh, right, uh, respond to. And I find uh, Mr. Mohan. Yeah, Mohan, <laughs> go ahead. Yes, sir, Mohanji. Oh, not Mohan, I think. Uh, Harish is there. Yeah. Harish, yes, sir. Harish, Harish. Sir, yeah. congratulations. I, I, I overheard that. some, some uh, about yeah. uh, World Pole and other. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, that, I, that particular part I have skipped here. After passing up his question, I skipped because of that. Yeah. yeah. Please go ahead. I, I think uh, I think passing off is an important thing because a yeah. lot of people don't understand what is a passing off. 
Oh, so, yeah, I think if you, if you can throw light on that, that right. with reference to Whirlpool case, Vistara case, yeah. case or anything like that. The other one is, I wanted you, it would be beneficial to other participants. I'm an advocate practicing in Bangalore. Yeah. Bangalore. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. I was in, at the NLS in 1990 and batch to, for LLM and it was still in Central College before yeah, I quit yeah. and started practicing. Correct, correct. This is a... Uh, I wanted uh, you to throw some light on on rectifications, amendments, and cancellation of trademarks already registered. Yeah, yeah. But, but anyhow, I can just start my debate on this. See, yes, as far sir. as passing of actions are concerned, uh, which uh, Mr. Harish uh, right, uh, rightly referred to, passing of actions uh, there are two. One is the classical form of passing of, the other one is the extended form of passing of. But as far as classical form of passing of is concerned. Uh, it is applicable when there is goodwill associated with a particular product and a particular uh, uh, representation of the goodwill, right? And the, the three elements that you find here, they are, uh, number one, there must be reputation or goodwill associated with the product. And number two, there must be misrepresentation or deception caused by the uh, respondent. And the third one, there must be damage that occurs. That if these three are established, then that would amount to uh, a passing of action. But passing of action has had its wider ramifications, right, much beyond just uh, a particular product. When I say extended form of passing off, this is uh, the test laid down by uh, Lord Diplock in Erwin Warning case. Erwin Warning case is a case where uh, the uh, goods were. Uh, uh, in the form of what is it, a geographical source, right? Uh, it was popularly called as avocat. Literally, it's called as advocat, right? But it's pronounced as avocat, A D O C A A T, avocat. And Erwin Warnick was selling avocat. Uh, and uh, when he was selling avocat, there were several other producers who were selling avocat. And the respondent also started, town and also started selling avocat. The difference between the first one and the second one was the second one they used uh, uh, Cypress Sherry and not the Spirit. As a consequence of which, the uh, product would be sold at a lesser price. And Edwin Warnick showed them. And the difference that defendant took up here was well, avocat is a descriptive term. How can you claim trademark protection for that? But prior to that, there were a series of other cases decided. Lord Diplock accepted the Finding of facts of the lower court. The lower court had clearly said that, that this is a distinctive mark and not a descriptive mark. Although this name refers to specific components of a particular product, still it has acquired such a wide reputation in the market that this has become a distinctive mark. That's the first one was settled. Second one, how do you determine passing graph? The Lord Diplock says that that there must be trading by a trader. And in the course of trading, there must be a misrepresentation. And the misrepresentation must be calculated to cause injury to the uh, consumers or the, the other party. Yeah, yeah. And then that is those four five prong five four prong tests were laid down by the uh, by Lord Diplock. And the five prong test here is called as an extended form of passing up. What do you look at in case of extended form of passing off? There would be not an individual goodwill, but a collective goodwill of many persons. And the second one, any of these persons who has a goodwill will be able to file a suit for passing off. And then the damage part remains. The damage part, both in case of classical form as well as here, would remain. That will have to be established. Now, the three elements, if I can look at the three elements as such. The goodwill element or the reputation element has a lot of legal complications right, within the framework of passing off. What is that, that complication that arose or arises in that particular case? Goodwill, right? Goodwill and the trade. Should there be trade in order to create a goodwill? Or can there be goodwill without trade also? These are all the questions that have come up over a period of time. And in passing off, the courts have applied something called as uh, soft lane approach and the hard lane approach. And you will be surprised, UK even now is following a hard lane approach. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court decided just four years back that 
we continue to hold the hard line approach as the approach for deferring parking lot. It was a case, it was a case relating to uh, uh, a TV service provider from Hong Kong and they did not have a presence in UK. The Supreme Court says that not having presence in UK is as much as not trading in UK. If it's not trading in UK, the transborder reputation itself would not entail you to any remedy and therefore uh, you can't claim this. So what is the soft lane approach and hard lane approach? Let me just point out that. In case of soft lane approach, the transborder reputation is taken into consideration while deciding the parking of action. And India luckily is following the soft lane approach. That is where that is where Harish and others were referring to referring the all the case laws, right? The series of case laws starting from Harper Brothers, Whirlpool, Whirlpool uh, uh, yeah, yeah, what not. All, all those cases, including Whirlpool. Microsoft cases, yeah. they are all Calvin Klein case was the first case. Calvin Klein, all these cases are relating to soft lane approach only. Even Calvin Caddy Klein had, yeah. Caddy law also. Caddy laws, yeah. Caterpillar. Caterpillar also. It's the same thing. In all those cases, there was transporter reputation, but none of them had registered their trademark in India. International apparel from Calcutta started using the word CK. And the court said, there is transporter reputation and people know about this particular word. And therefore, that reputation needs to be protected. And if anyone wants to pass off the good under that name, is liable for passing of action. So that is, uh, that is what is called a soft lane approach. Whereas in case of hard lane approach, they said, well, there is need for trading activities to be going on in that particular jurisdiction for that to acquire reputation or goodwill. And in the absence of that, it doesn't take. I distinctly remember Lord McNaughton, right, in, uh, in one of the cases, in, in River uh, Remedy case, something like that. In that case, he makes a categorical statement saying that business is associated with goodwill. Take away the business, goodwill vanishes. It goes. It goes. And there are series of other cases which come up now. Supposing I have not started trading at all. Tata company has started uh, its activities, releasing several products. And imagine tomorrow it wants to release another new brand, brand new product in the market. It starts advertising, but it does not produce a particular car at all. The car is not coming to the market. And now tomorrow if some other person wants to use that particular name, Assuming again that Tata has not gone to registration of trademark in the trademark registry. Assuming that. If it has gone to registration. Nano car, car issue was still there. Nano car there, yeah. Nano car issue happened. Exactly. And now, if some other person wants to use a similar name, and if what Tata wants to prevent that, how would it prevent that? Since the product is not there, there is no trading. Since there is no trading, there is no trader for that particular product. In the absence of trader for that particular trade, where is the goodwill generated here? So this raises a question whether there is what is called a pre-trade goodwill or not. But the courts have gone ahead and said, especially in BBC case in UK, the courts have gone ahead and said that, that well, if there is an established reputation for the organization as such, for the Tata company in this case, then that Worldwide reputation reputation. could pass on, exactly. That reputation could pass on to the new products and new name that's going to release. And thereby, there could exist a pre trade goodwill also. The next question that comes up is yes, you stop your business once for all, wind up your business, Tata company closes, and then some other person wants to use the word Tata. Okay, there's no Tata now. Right? Is there goodwill existing after the trade ends? It's also a question that has come up here. I'm only talking about the goodwill part now. Correct. Goodwill part. Right? Whether there is, uh, there is uh, also goodwill there or not. And one of the cases the Privy Council has said, Star International case, Privy Council has said that, that if the organization has wound up, but if it is existing in terms of reputation, then it will still have the opportunity of gathering up that reputation and then gaining the goodwill and it will be having a local standing for filing the suit for passing of action. So post uh, trade goodwill is also possible. But Whirl, the, Whirl, Whirlpool case happened like that only. Whirlpool in yeah. India had closed down, yeah. but it had a worldwide reputation. Worldwide reputation. Which, Similarly, which, Tiger uh, Bomb also. Similarly, Tiger Bomb also. Right. Tiger Bomb case, uh, the half hour brothers were from Burma. They were from Burma and they were trading in India and because of some uh, import uh, restriction, they could not sell the Tiger Bomb in India. Example. Even when a person from Tamil Nadu started using the Tiger Bomb. 
Yes. Right? And this is a bit became, became the problem. And of course, the court said that, well, even if they are not trading here, say that by, by the mere misuse, sorry, non use of that, it would not get automatically right, uh, uh, deregister. It would not get it, get that particular status. Still, the reputation continues, and therefore, you will have the remedy against a person who is going to infringe upon that. And again, you find non use section 47 of the uh, Act. Uh, that is what perhaps uh, Mr. Harish is also referring to, 45, 47, and the 48, uh, these provisions he is referring to. Very true. Well, yeah, well, I could make out. Uh, at the moment, is raising a question. <laughs> 47 is, a, is where uh, uh, you are trying to uh, right, uh, remove the uh, trademark from the registration for non use of the mark. For non use of the mark. What is non use again? I go, that is, uh, I, th I think any law student should. Take up this particular thing and start looking at the research on the word use itself. Whether the use should be commercial use and what is the kind of use. Supposing I, as a promoter of a particular company, get registered a particular name and I do not use it. My The whole intention of mine is to transfer it to the company which I want to establish. Initially, I have registered it. So in that particular case, can you say that registration was done without any intention to use it for himself and therefore could it be cancelled? Because section 18 of the trademark act clearly says that either the person who is already a proprietor of trademark can go for application for registration or a person who wants to be a bona fide user of that particular mark for a particular goods also can go for registration. In this case, am I a bona fide user or is there you know, non use of the product? In such circumstances, there is an exception provided in section 47 itself, which says, yes, you can take up as a defense the extraordinary circumstances under which you are unable to use it for any purpose in the media. One circumstance is war situation. Another circumstance is import restriction situation. Right? And these are, these are circumstances where you can still defend and then say, the non-use for was for a valid reason. And therefore, this should not be rectified. It should not be removed from the register. Right, sir? The, yeah. the last, last one is, sir, wrongly registered trademark continuing to remain wrongly in the trademark register. What action? Yeah, yeah. I think you should tell me, as a practitioner, what no. are you going to do? This is a very interesting point, so I thought it's better that uh, yeah, yeah. your views on this also. Please, please initiate. I'll, I'll comment on that. No, that's what a wrongly registered trademark continuing to remain on the trademark register. Who is going to take action against it? Is, uh, as long as people are aware of such a thing, how to identify that? Ah, yeah, that this, is this a competitor challenge under the trademark act at the moment in India. Yeah, the competitors are expected to do that because when, when once it is uh, put in the domain uh, and uh, in the freezing period. That is what is uh, happening, and uh, the competitors, if any, they would uh, move it. Uh, to identify which is a wrongly registered trademark is a million dollar question. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's correct. That this is the greatest there. challenge under the trademark law at the moment in India. Lot of names wrongly registered correct, continue correct. to remain, and no action against it. Mohan Krishna, sir, your views, if, if Mohan Krishna, sir, has yeah, to see. say all that also. With regard to the distinctiveness is concerned, there is a provision the trademark law professor uh, can uh, enlighten us. And yeah. in the, uh, at the time of registration, it doesn't have distinctiveness. At least up to the challenge period, if because of its use, it obtains the distinctiveness again, it can be upheld. And uh, they don't look into this uh, the absence of distinctiveness at the time of making application. I think uh, I am subject to the correction by Professor Ramakrishna. <laughs> No, no, no. The, the provision no, no. is very clear. There is a provision which says, as far as distinctness is concerned, mm. that cannot be questioned after a certain stage. Mm. There is a time limit for that. And after that, you are not going to question the distinctiveness of that particular mark and that remains there. But yes. the question of Mr. Harish is that which remains there is deemed to be distinctive, right? It's deemed ah. to be distinctive. There is no doubt about that under the law. But can you remove that? That's and the who question. Who should take action? That's the Mohan, question. Ah, Mohan was trying to say that. Someone who is interested should take initiative. But then the next question is whether it is wrongly remaining on the register or not is again a, a big question. Yeah, that's can, the one. Yeah, can you just go in as, as US went once 
for removing all the dead woods. So like how you are repealing all the unused acts. Some yes, exactly. proactive action from the registry itself should happen also. It happens in the registry. Monitoring registered trademarks is not happening. Whether they are being in use, not use, it was wrongly registered. Uh, yeah. Proactiveness from the trademark registry is not happening. Yeah. No, no. When, when we say wrongly registered, uh, there are multiple questions from a host of questions that come here. What do you mean by wrongly registered? Right. Did the trademark office ignore section 9 and section 11 while registering this particular thing? Did the trademark office ignore section 13 and then other provisions while registering this? For example, names of living persons. Yeah. Abdul Kalam's name has been registered. And can Abdul Kalam's name be registered? He was the president. It has been registered. Who registered that is the next question. They will have to get into that particular part. You will be surprised the relative of close relative of Abdul Kalam has registered that. Right? If it's by third person, perhaps the trademark agency would have refused. But since it is from the closest relative, they have permitted him to register the particular family member. Mark. Mm -hmm. So, like that, are there marks which are registered in violation of the provision itself? Again, you find, again, if in all the legislations, uh, Mr. Harish would agree, not only trademark law, but all legislations all, 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 have, all. have good faith provisions. Yeah. So if the you trademark to... registry registers that in good faith, you will not be able to take action against the trademark officers at all. Right. Something like Patent Act also says that if the patent is granted uh, in good faith by the patent office, you are not going to question the patent office, but you are going to question the patent itself. Question Action. the patent in the court of law and then try to revoke that particular patent, but not going to question the trademark proprietor and the patent examiner who granted that. So this good faith provision is there everywhere. But this requires an administrative action. That is that's what I am looking at. Removal, and an incident happened here. There is a precedent for that. US, long back, some 20 years back, it started weeding out, it called as the dead woods. Started Correct. weeding out all the dead woods, saying that there are many, many which are remaining on the, uh, on the register History. without being used. Without being used. So for non use, it can be removed. And one instance, if I can recall, even Infosys, you know, the word Infosys for a specific product of Infosys was removed for non use after five years. Infosys, as a trademark for the entire the services, is remaining, but for a specific goods, it was removed. The trademark registry. That's possible. possible. Thank you. Yeah. That's yeah. good. And uh, the question is, so uh, sir, session will continue. Uh, maybe take you know, one minute. Prasenjit. Yes, Mohanji. Prasenjit. Sir, 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 please uh, 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 enlighten us with regard to the prior use, sir, prior user rights. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> sir, that's Prayers were right again, like the one which uh, Whirlpool, made, Whirlpool. Is, is again a very vast. No, no, Whirlpool is one. I think you should go to the latest decision given by the Madras High Court in uh, Krishna Sweet's case. Ah, Krishna Sweet. Yeah. And, and, and prior to that, you know, uh, the uh, Jarda, what was the Jarda? Uh, Panpara. No, sir. The, the name of. Uh, okay. I'm not getting the. Yeah. Kenny, yes. something? No, no. Name of a person? Name of a person? I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know. This is what happened. That that very popular, it's a very popular Jarada manufacturing thing. And it was manufactured in selling. And it, it, it taking advantage of its position, it sued a small manufacturer in one of the places in Lucknow or somewhere. And that goes before the court. You'll be surprised. The court says, that in this particular case, the respondent, a small manufacturer, was the prior user of this particular thing. And he continues to have a dominance and you can't move against him. And then there was a counter claim for cancellation of registration of this. And the court acknowledged that and then cancelled the registration of a popular brand. And that is now using it some other, uh, what is that, uh, some other name and it's for marketing this particular product. So the name of an individual. Right, uh, which is confusingly similar to the prior user. Right, so prior user has these rights. Prior user cannot be proceeded against by the trademark register, uh, registered trademark proprietor, even if it's a registered trademark proprietor. Right? Can the prior user seek registration now? I'm not talking about the registered user. The registered user, right. then he can definitely. Definitely get it corrected and then uh, right, remove that from the register on the ground of 
is a p similarity but a prior user who has not registered that what are the remedies for him he can Very register cool. sir yeah he can register it says i am coming to that he has not registered now what yeah. under what ground he can he register so the problem now which comes up before him is he will have to inevitably invoke section 12 of the trademark act section yes. 12 of the trademark act provides for honest concurrent user and then when he goes for concurrent concurrent user registration uh, the, the registrar can impose certain conditions and then grant the registration what would be the condition usually the condition would be geographical limitations disclaimers you can use this but you say this particular disclaimer so that the consumer will not be ultimately confused but registration yes registration is possible but again the problem is there is need for concurrence this is a practice uh, part of it mr arish would be knowing that yes. uh, you need the concurrence of the prior registered uh, the proprietor for honest concurrent use registration see that's the problem to which the prior user would be put but as far as legal indemnity is concerned he is indemnified from being sued by the registered proprietor he can continue to use that particular thing as long as there is a disclaimer and then as long as there is no uh, confusion similarity section 30 onwards 30 31 32 33 mm -hmm. right, those are the provisions which highlight the rights of the prior user anything else you want to add uh, no no yeah. i call upon uh, point to uh, look into the other questions and uh, continue yeah. the question and answer session anyway sir uh, the, as far as passing of his consent there has been incidental references even uh, regional variation has been taken into consideration in tv venugopal case yeah 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 so uh, 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 light on that Ushodaya case. Yeah, Ushodaya. You have referred to that particular case already. That's what. Anyway, what? The, I I have yeah, some yeah, opinion but... that it has been wrongly decided. Huh? Because they they belong to two different fields. Yeah. And uh, and therefore, uh, TV and Gopal must have been given the benefit uh, the, that uh, that hasn't been done, and uh, the the so-called goodwill and other things have been taken into consideration, and uh, the hard uh, hardliner approach, which must have been adopted by the Supreme Court, uh, hasn't been adopted. That's what I I I wanted to I wanted you to throw uh, right on that. Uh, sir, here the hardliner approach would not come into. <laughs> <laughs> more, more of a subjective <laughs> satisfaction of the judge. For the simple reason. That's what. That's what. That's where I differ with you. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the hard and soft and approach is not here because it's not a question of equity. Yeah. Yeah. In most of these yeah, cases, more and. Yeah. Yeah. In most of these cases, subjective satisfaction of the judges uh, is what is happening in the court. Because. Yeah, the, I remember. The argument I also was why. quite interesting, and uh, when when uh, the yeah. when Inado incense sticks were registered in uh, Karnataka, the name that signifies Karnataka. Inado, the meaning of the name also was taken into consideration. Inado in Kannada means uh, this land, yeah. whereas Inado in uh, under our uh, Telugu language it means uh, today. And that distinction also having all these disparities also in mind, uh, there hasn't been the benefit given to TV and Gopal, and uh, that was quite surprising. And the way uh, the way the court uh, had taken uh, uh, the, the into consideration all the precedents uh, elaborately from various decisions, yet uh, ultimately TV and Gopal was put to loss. That's interesting. <laughs> Uh, interestingly, the session judge trial court has uh, gave an order on passing up. Yes, on that, the other people, Bangalore people, preferred an appeal before single judge bench, mm -hmm. and where the single judge has set aside the lower court order, and again these people preferred an appeal before, before the letter patent appeal. The letter patent appeal again they were successful. Uh, the uh, and the ground of uh, copyright and trademark who the name was wrong, and Edu Gopal preferred an appeal to the Supreme Court over that. And finally, it has given the Ramoji Rao a new, rather benefit or a prize, like in the well known case, country court and the well known mark in Telugu speaking states are concerned. Yeah, that's what. Right. Correct. Yeah. I don't know when there are when there are two different distinct fields, 
and usage of name how can you how can you attribute to a particular prior user or something like that and uh, okay as far as the design yeah, is yeah. concerned if you have objections that can be that can be uh, uh, just uh, uh, prevented but uh, as far as the name is concerned you must have uh, asked him to continue your business in your own area but giving a, giving a, a particular time limit of uh, exhaustion of uh, the goods uh, uh, till the exhaustion of the goods uh, you can market and uh, you need to close down and he had he is nowhere in the picture and uh, now he went yeah, to gopal i think yeah. uh, i think our uh, hari sir uh, I, i know him presenting <laughs> I know him. <laughs> he is yeah, now. He is no more of more of real estate. Doomed, doomed to the logical end because of the court decision. Because he was almost closing down his. Uh, Ashiki Agarbati. Yeah. Ashiki yes, also was there. In order, Ashiki all yeah. those things. Both. It has been closed down. Yeah, but, but what happened to I think Harish who is practicing Bangalore knows what happened to Malapan Company. Ah, right, Malappa was easy. Malappa products. No, they are related to food. He started using yeah, Malappa and company started using the word M, McDonald's M. Yes, correct. And and if you apply the same logic, the court should have not have applied. Court should have permitted That's him it. to continue with Malappa and son M. Correct. M had become a, an internationally renowned uh, reputation. Oh, yeah. Sanitary ware so, they are very popular. Uh, exactly the, the well known mark concept has creeped in perhaps ma uh, mohan ji yes, even in case of ushodaya case yes. the well known trademark concept was crept in uh-huh. and that was a win for the judge that's deciding uh, this particular case that's correct and the, like, in, a way, in a way what i feel is that they are biased towards ramu ji <laughs> no no <laughs> they had they yeah, had right. taken reasons <laughs> that, uh, yeah. from the other way around the possibility possible all celebrity status people oh, somewhere oh. some inclination will be there towards <laughs> them there's a yeah, what, i think there's what happens in this entire process ah uh, what happens in this entire process i just want your uh, quick remark uh, once this uh, well known trademark concept comes in hmm. and you start refusing registration of similar okay. mark for dissimilar goods as well hmm. then the whole classification of goods and services ultimately yeah. would get diluted that's correct that's 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 what is happening sir right the very objective of classification was to ensure that you get protection only in a particular class of goods for a particular yes. class of goods yes and if that you are not in this field why should there period. be any objection more so when it is not similar trade yeah that's it that's what okay prasenjit please continue yes sir okay yeah continue uh SRK question. Yes. So, what is your opinion on registration of names like SRK, STP, and Thilari by Haruk Khan, Sachin Tendulkar, and Akshay Kumar? Yes, sir. Sorry, question. You are registering a particular right uh, acronym of your name as a trademark. Do you know? Do you know the word Gabbar Singh has been registered as a trademark? And yes. many of the characters in Shola have been registered as a trademark. And Harry Potter has been registered as a trademark. The case went before the Mumbai High Court uh, when uh, Harry Potter, the Warner Brothers, sued them. I think it was 20th century for. They sued them, and uh, in the court, the question was: Is it trademark protection? Is it copyright protection? You know, copyright protection cannot be given for the titles. There are a series of cases, right, uh, including the, the Supreme Court decision. their copyright is not given for the title then they said trademark fine harry potter and the respondent had used the word harry potter for his movie so now the question is is there confusing similarity between harry potter and harry potter so the court took into consideration the audience audience in india people in india and the court comes to the conclusion categorical conclusion that no indian will ever relate harry potter to Any Harry Potter or Harry Potter, yes. so there's no no question of likelihood of confusion. So all these terms are registered, and you know Justice Manmohan Singh, latest uh, when when uh, Ram Kumar Verma's Ag movie that issue came up, then he started using word using characters which are similar to Gabbar Singh and all those characters, Thakur and etc. And uh, uh, city association they had already registered these as trademarks. 
One more thing categorically says that these are confusingly similar to already registered trademark, right? On the one hand, and therefore you can't violate a trademark of the uh, plaintiff, the petitioner. And second one, it also goes ahead and it says the characters in the entire movie, Shole, has been by changing certain nomenclatures have been used here continuously, and therefore even the copyright violation happens. So trademark registration can be done for this, provided you're going to indicate as to the class of goods for which you're going to apply those things. If signature of Sachin Tendolkar can be used for a particular product. That what prevents the name of Amitabh Bachchan or any other person to be used for the product? That all that is required is Amitabh Bachchan should give consent for that. Right? Yes. Yeah, next. That's true. Mm -hmm. next. Obviously, Amitabh Bachchan can't give any consent now. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 it may not be say. out of place. Gabbar Singh. Iconic character Amjad Khan who, who portrayed that. Amjad yeah. Khan is the first, first uh, 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 villain in the film industry of Bollywood to have an opportunity to, to, to do a commercial ad. Yeah, of yeah. Gabbar ki asli pasand, quality yeah. biscuit or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true, true. Right. Otherwise, only heroes were being given the commercial yeah, ad and yeah. endorsements. He, gave, yeah. he became so popular a woman that uh, villain that. Uh, Every household, uh, every child was uh, even threatened to, to take milk and uh, food. Uh, <laughs> yes, the dialogue is also there in the movie. Jab yes. bache, jab hota hai. Ah, <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, chale, chale move on to the next question. Yeah, next. Yes, I do mimicry of Amjad Khan. I am I, I have done mimicry of Amjad Khan's oh, You're going to do it now. No, no doubt. <laughs> Please give a chalak, no problem. No, we can do it. The second question is that, uh, from uh, Dr. Mohan Krishan. Uh, oh, please please explain please the please concept please. of... Go ahead. Yes, ask the question. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, please explain the concept of dissimilarities in the essential features test. I got it explained in the... See, this dissimilarity issue, that's why I was referring to Cadilla case. The IKM case had focused on dissimilarities for the purpose of determining deceptive similarity. And that's a wrong trend, wrong way of analyzing deceptive similarity. And deceptive similarity test was laid down by a Cadillac court by saying that, that you should look at the similarities between the two marks. And by looking at the dissimilarities, you should look at the dominant features of the two marks. Put them side by side, compare them. Compare them both visual similarities Politic similarities as well as conceptual or overall similarities, or structural similarities. And after that, determine whether there's a confusing similarity or not. And therefore, similarity constitutes the most important part. Diagram case, if you go diagram case, you will get a lot of interpretation of dissimilarities. But that is not the foundation for determining infringement or passing off action. Should not be. That is a wrong judgment by the Supreme Court. A major dis difference between Copyright Act and trademark is here we look at uh, deceptive similarities, there we look at, uh, at uh, differences. Now there we look at substantial similarities again. Ah, Not even the differences. No, no, substantial similarity. Yeah. Substantially similar, we determine copyright infringement. Whereas here we are yeah. looking at deceptive yeah. similarities. There also we look at similarities only. Again, it's copyright. If you go for differences, then they, they, again, that will lead to different consequences. Ah, that's, that's yeah. the other reason why I said. Yeah, yeah. You see, there is something called as intelligent copying. Mm. The Madras High Court in series of decisions in copyright have said about intelligent copying. Yeah. A person who copies, invariably will have to be intelligent, right? And when he copies, he copies everything except few the things that he is going to modify. And the extent of modification by him becomes relevant here. If they are... In spite of the modification, if the entire work looks substantially similar, it should amount to infringement of copyright. Okay. So that's the, yeah, yeah, infringement of copyright. So substantial similarity. And you know, if you go to copyright law, uh, I'm sure most of you must have heard of subconscious copying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I have heard a particular song today, and maybe after 10 years, I might not be listening to that. And now I start sitting and start composing a music tone. 
I compose a music tone and ultimately when I release it, intentionally I have not copied anything. But if the work is similar to the to work you yeah. already created, then, then the court will ask, hey, did you copy it? I may, I may argue and provide evidence saying that I did not deliberately copy it. But the first question there is, was there access to that particular copyrighted work? Answer is yes. Is it substantially similar to the work? Answer is yes. Then you cannot take up a defense that you were memory parade a trick. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then therefore it becomes subconscious copying of the work. So that is how copyright law applies. Can I proceed? Yes, that's please. Okay. Sir, uh, Dr. Uh, Mosumi Kalita is asking. What yeah. is the difference between trademark and register symbols? What do you mean by? I'm not getting here. Yes, no, no, what I could guess from that is, see, now you use the word, right, Zadila, top you use the word TM. Hmm. Or Zadila, top you use the word R in circuit, right? Whenever, whenever a trademark is not registered, the word TM is used. You have just filed an application, or you're using it as a trademark, you just use the word TM. But after registration, it is mandatory for you to use the word R in a circuit, saying that that is registered trademark. That may be the difference between TM and R in circuit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question from Dunumani Vaishya. Uh, what's the difference between collective mark and well known trademark? Yeah. And, and trade hmm. name and trademark? Yeah. It's, it's not much of. Uh, difficulty here. Yeah? Well-known mark is for an individual mark which acquires reputation in the society and there are at least eight or nine factors that are considered which are provided in section 11, 5 up to section 11, uh, 11, right, subsection 11, 11. They have provided various grounds on which the court or the trademark office can come to the conclusion to it's a well-known mark. For example, the promotion, the number of uh, consumers, the geographical area, and then how they have tried to defend themselves against the, the, the unscrupulous user, uh, all these factors. But registration is not mandatory for becoming a well-known mark. This is one part of it. Whereas a collective mark is a mark which can be used by the members of that particular organization, right? As part of that particular organization, that's a collective mark. And the second one, the, what's the second one that you said? Difference between? Trade name and trademark, sir. Trade name and a trademark, yeah. See, see, trade, trade name, I, I gave the typical example in the course of my presentation. Elora Industries. Elora Industries is trading it under Elora Industries name itself. Right? Whereas for a particular product, they are using the word different name. So the name that is used with respect to the product as such, or the service as such, would become a trademark. Right? Whereas if, you are, if your style is different, style is under Elora Industries, that is the trade name. Can trade name become a trademark? Answer is yes. Can trade name over a period of time become a trademark? Answer is yes. You have a trade name and you go and say, for all my product that I want to sell, I'm going to use the same name. Yeah. Just the exam the example is, sir, uh, 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 to give another example. M E M E M E uh, Restaurants Private Limited or some, some that is the name of the, of the parent company which runs the KFC. The brand name of the product is KFC. Kentucky Fried Chicken. Okay, yeah. but the company name is a different trade name. That is ME -E -E Restaurants Limited or something. That's that's yeah. that's yeah, even, even, even HLL also, Hindustan HLL, Limited. then Coffee Day, Coffee Day, Amalgamated Beans Private Correct. Limited is Correct. the name of the company. Coffee yeah. Day is the brand name. Yeah. Trade name is of the, of the company as such. Yeah. That's a trading style also. That's right. So it's a connecting question from the same person. Uh, that whether Patanjali and mm -hmm. Amul is a well-known trademark or a collective mark? Uh, no, no. Am Amul, Amul is definitely now uh, uh, a well-known mark. I think the court has declared it to be a well-known mark and uh, nobody can use that particular mark as such. Uh, Patanjali, it's not a collective mark as such. Why, where is the question of collective mark coming up in case of Patanjali? It's it's uh, Baba Ramadev and his company which is being manufacturing and using it exclusively. And if tomorrow uh, my friends, all of them are permitted to use potentially uh, under collective mark, perhaps that may create the status of collective mark. Until then, you'll have to wait whether it becomes collective mark or not. I don't think it has become a collective mark. Uh, 
See, there are instances where Julia Roberts dot com was taken away. I think right. all of them was like Julia Roberts dot com was used. Julia Roberts was able to remove that from the paper space. Then pretty woman. Then, yeah. <laughs> pretty woman. Pretty woman. That's the movie yeah. in which she. Yeah. 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 Precisely. And yeah. yes, please, please go ahead, Prasenjit. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, can there be two marks coexist? That's what I told you. Yeah, section 12 is uh, the one which I referred to just now. 12 permits honest concurrent use. Honest concurrent use. When does honest concurrent use come? You know, the interpretation of the word honest, the interpretation of the word concurrent, both are said to be done. Have they been used simultaneously by each other? Whether each other are aware of the use of the other and still they have not taken any action against the other, tolerating the use of that, acquiescing the use of that particular thing or not. In that particular context, if they are bona fide permitting the other one to use it simultaneously, they become honest concurrent users, and they can definitely invoke Section 12 of the Trademark Act and get both of them can get registration for that particular mark. Subject However, to prior users' uh, consent. You say it. It's subject to prior users' consent. That's it. Next step. Uh, question from Anamika Kalita: Whether a company can change its trademark few years later? After registration, you mean to say the trade name or the trademark? If you are referring to company law, I will say. She asked about the trademark. trademark. This is this is that what which I asked you amendment to trademark. They, they, can, can they change that particular trademark? You mean to say? Whether a company can change its yes, trademark yes. few years yes. later after registration? That's that. See that 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 becomes an entirely new trademark altogether. We are going for registration of MR with few additions there. Right? There are provisions like section 14, 15, and 16. If you look at, there is what is called a series mark, right? Series mark. If you have a composite mark, you can split them and then say that part of this I want to register separately, part of this I want to register separately, and comprehensively I want to register one particular mark. So that particular provision is there, and similarly, you can also go ahead and then register the same mark for different products uh, of which you are going to sell, and that is also possible within the framework of trademark law. And if you are modifying it, the modified version would become a new trademark, and the previous one you had to get cancelled if you do not want to continue with the previous one. Right? The modified one, the modified one, if it is almost similar to the previous one that you had. Only you will have the right of registration of the modified version, which is similar to the previous one, which is possible and permitted. Okay. So of course, if a different product is released and a different trademark can be applied by sure, the same sure. company. Sure, 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 sure. If it's a different product, definitely they'll have to take a different uh, trademark. Yes. Yeah, fresh trademark will have to take. Because you can't use uh, the trademark that you have uh, taken for X product on Y for product, y product. Still claims, uh, and still claim the trademark for X. There is a Next question, question from Dr. Pranay Kumar Aditya. Hmm. Uh, sir, can there be a trademark even if unregistered with a disclaimer to avoid prosecution? Can there be? Can there be a trademark even if unregistered with a disclaimer to avoid prostitution? I am not getting the question. Uh, the first part I could understand. Can there be an unregistered trademark? Absolutely. That is where process of action would come in. You will still be having a right over the unregistered trademark. Right? The disclaimer part I did not write. Uh, right. So, Pranay sir, if you can make it more clear. Then it will be very helpful for us. But disclaimer is only to avoid pro uh, pro prosecution. That's what is their question. Disclaimer okay. is not a protection. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, you see, <laughs> let me just tell you a very interesting uh, story relating to the domain name. Uh, you know, disclaimers are there, but most of the time, disclaimers will not will not give uh, protection. Give the advantage, advantage of the protection. protection. Uh, sorry for using this, but this is uh, decided case. Walmart. No, the real, Wal, Walmart. Walmart. Com is there, but someone started using the word Walmart Sucks. Com. <laughs> Walmart Sucks. Com is is not connected with Walmart, right? 
right? It's a, it's a disclaimer. Despite disclaimer, the, the court held that it is passing off. We are using the mark similar to Walmart. So disclaimer by itself would not. But disclaimer should be to such an extent that it doesn't lead to confusion among the confusers, uh, consumers. Consumer. For, example, for example, Walmart. Walmart's uh, uh, word was picked up by uh, shirt manufacturers in US. And you know, they compare this Walmart's activities to Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Something like when the Holocaust comes, everyone is going to eat away every month. Walmart, when it comes, it is going to eat away all the, all the retailers. retailers. <laughs> so in that context, he manufactured t-shirts and sold it under the name Wallocast. Okay. Not Wallocast. Mm -hmm. not, not Holocaust. Wallocast. Wallocast. And he was sued. And the court said, where is that? Who will confuse it, you with Walmart? <laughs> this, is a, this is a parody that they are making. <laughs> this parody could, should, should be tolerated. So Wallahas could be used also. No issues at all. Yeah. Question from Dipavali Brahma. Hmm. Uh, is there any relation between trademark act and the design act? Yeah, yeah. There, there is a, a direct connection between these two. Uh, <laughs> in the sense that definition of designs in the section 2 expressly excludes trademark from its, pur its purview. If it's already a trademark, it cannot become a design. Right? And section section uh, uh, 9 of section 3, it says that shape of goods can become trademark also, except those three circumstances. So shape can become a trademark, but shape is a design. But if it's a trademark, then it would not qualify for design protection. So that relationship is there between trademark and design. Uh, the simple thing is one, one identifies the source of goods and the proprietor of those goods. The second one is no way connected to the proprietor or the source. The second one is only connected with the IAP to the consumer. So one is aesthetic utility. The second one is identification function. That's the difference between trademark and design. Yeah. Sir, can a, can a trademark owner as well as the design owner, registered design owner, can proceed against the defendant on the same, on the same cause of action under the two law remedies, both under trademark law as well as the design law? Yeah. Same yes. Cause of action. yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know. Uh, the Delhi High Court has addressed this particular issue recently uh, of uh, what is that composite, uh, composite suit. Composite right? suit. Yeah, yeah. In case of trademark, it's a question of passing off. And in case of design, it is a, a infringement or piracy. And can there be composite suits or not? And the court has categorically said, there can be initiation of two different suits, but both of them could be taken up by the court right for decision. But there cannot be a composite suit combining these two issues together, is what the Delhi High Court has said. I think Mohan Lal case, uh, if I'm right. My name. Lal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have not become lal, sir. No. <laughs> My name and the yeah, yeah. <laughs> lal to be added. Yeah. Okay, sir. Which is wearing, all the Miss Harish is wearing lal shirt. Yeah, that's <laughs> Yes, sir. Mohan Lal Kit, most probably. Yes. Yes, sir. So, sir, like, continue. Yes, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, question from Vivek Kesviva. Uh, if a private firm who is providing different types of professional services under one roof, can that firm register his or her name, firm's name, and logo as a trademark? What prevents what is the complication there? Mr. No, Harish no, already no. has pointed out clearly yeah, that the trade name, so trade name could be used as a trademark. And you'll have to register that. And if you go for registration, I think you will have an upper hand because nobody else would have used it as a trade name also. And thereby, distinctiveness would already be established. It can be. See, previously they used to do what is called as house mark. You know what is house mark? House mark is you have different products sold by you. And for all the different products, you're using the same name. That becomes a house mark as such. But now I think that it's gone. They're using different marks for different products that they sell. And you know, in case of companies, it is not the launching of the product that is most important for the companies. And they always say, what is important for us is to launch a brand. Brand name, brand equity, brand, brand. name. They launch a brand. 
when they launch a brand, they pick up the blockbuster product of them and then they launch a particular brand. And launching a brand ultimately gives them the goodwill for other products also. Yes. You know, Pepsi, Pepsi has different variants also now. Mm. Most of us do not know what are those variants. At least I do not know. One or two I know. Thumbs up is one. Right? Yes. <laughs> there are different, different variants. We do not know the variants. All of us prefer only to Pepsi only. Yes. Earlier you had Pepsi Cola, you had different other things also, variants in Pepsi. Yeah, yeah, true. They have given up. Mm. They have given up now. Yeah. Uh, it's a question from Nitin Galo. Uh, mm. What is the doctrine of delusion? Delusion. Delusion has been delusion. Delusion has been dealt with so elaborately now. You gave another, you gave an example already on that. Mm. Yeah, Maggie, you should uh, ask to remember Maggie at least. <laughs> right? Delusion. Okay. I think if, the participant late joined. If he has not at, uh, understood that particular thing, I'll just give him the example of uh, uh, that. What is that? Uh, Forty thieves, sir. Example. Which one? Charlie's chore. Al Ali Baba. Ali Baba. Ali, Ali Baba. Ali Baba. Charlie's chore. We mm -hmm. need that, that particular girl. The Ali Baba had come uh, sent his uh, followers to put an X mark in front of a house which they wanted to attack. Right. And what do you, that was distinct enough. Because they were able to identify that particular thing. And tomorrow that girl went and then put the X mark in front of all the houses. Oh, no. What happened to the first one X? It got deleted. It got deleted. That's, that's it, right? Present G is the only person sitting here in yes. the entire hall. And if there are other present Gs in this particular uh, room, then present G's distinctiveness is lost here. It's dilution. That's dilution. Simple term. There yeah. is a similar movie which has come in the name of uh, Peter Yes, and Almira, Almira, all the Almiras are the, are the same color, same design, and the particular hero hides in one of them. The question from yeah. Doctor uh, Chokyo Taku, mm -hmm. uh, sir, what about trade market in networking business run by different production company like Amway, Safe Soap? Smart value, Avon, etc. What about online marketing system? See, whether it is online or offline, as long as it is not deceptively similar, you can market your product in a particular name. The moment it becomes deceptively similar or diluting, then you are liable for infringement. That's it. That's the, that's the principle that applies everywhere online or offline. Right? Yes, sir. So, uh, same person is asking, asking a different question. Uh, might be he's making it more specific. Sir, what about indigenous crafting, uh, crafting, making it uh, which are made at villages is coming under what type of marketing? Handicrafts. Yeah. Village cottage industries and yeah. handicrafts. Yeah. They can also use the e-platform also now. See, most of the GIs now are using the e-platforms. They all come from the handicrafts in the villages, etc. Village and cottage industries, handicrafts. Yeah. And they, they have the, the internet presence now to a large extent. Most of their goods are sold on Alibaba and other platforms. Yes. Yeah. And even startups of the, those artisans are also encouraged by the government, uh, especially yeah. the government of India. Like in yeah. A lot of exemptions and all they get village and cottage industries, promotion of oh, village yeah. and cottage industry. They can go and exhibit their products and uh, the entire cost is owned by the state. Mm. Especially in Karnataka, VTPC, and VTPC is bearing all these expenses. Correct. Mm. Yes, Prashant ji. Uh, a question from Sajal Sarma. Mm. What will be the three most important difference between a trademark and a geographical indication? Why three? There are many. First one. First three. Yeah. <laughs> First, <laughs> one, is, one, one is an individual right, yes. other is a collective right, right? Second one, the quality, characteristics and reputation are associated inextricably with the geographical origin mm -hmm. case of GI. Whereas the quality is a different attitude, it's consistency of quality that comes in trade. And the third most important, there are many, but the third most important one. Trademark can be licensed, assigned, etc., etc., whereas GI cannot be alienated at all at any cost. These are three differences. Because you want the, 
in association with the High Court of uh, Assam and uh, the High Court of uh, Arunachal Pradesh. I conducted a six-day IPR workshop, right? And that went on for six days. And faculty members from uh, law, law college, and faculty members from Assam Agriculture University, and different parts of Northeast participated in that. A very huge gathering was there, right? And then after that, of course, National Law University has come there, come and there. they have been, and, uh, and and we conducted one uh, conference there also. And Gauhati, I keep coming for IPR works only. You'll be surprised. Mm. Uh, there is something called as PST, Department of Science and Technology, Science. right? And which has uh, a PIC, Patent Information Cell, in Gauhati itself. And Patent Information Center is found in all the states of uh, Northeast. Northeast. Uh, Tripura, uh, uh, Nagaland. Yeah. I, I am on the expert committee of this particular uh, DST uh, uh, ah. patent presentation cell. And we were trained the is the officers of the entire region for two, three days there. And we keep meeting uh, with them. A lot of IP activities are going on there. I would suggest President Chief and then uh, Brahma to associate with everything and then find out as to what is the stage at which they are. In fact, just four days back, one patent has been granted to uh, an, a, a scientist and that was supported and assisted by the PAC itself. Just four days back, they have granted a patent. So that's the kind of work that's going on. And a lot of GA registration also happens in that particular region. And so you, must be know, Bharali, sir. you must be knowing about uh, Moga. Moga silk. Moga silk. The, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the users were registered GI. when Mr. Uh, Prabhuda Gangali was there. So a lot of activities are going on in Northeast. A lot of potentials are there, especially the potential is with respect to GI and the traditional knowledge registration order that they have. First and GI was say, Darjeeling tea. Darjeeling tea. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In the country, Darjeeling tea was the first GI. Both the and name sir. and the and the mark. Yes, sir. And the three hundred and the name. Sir, and the three hundred and seventieth GI is Sohrai Kova painting from Jharkhand. Jharkhand. Oh. And I'm happy to say that that is facilitated by my Center for Intellectual Property Rights. Oh, which, has an, which has a unit in Ranchi, oh, supported by the government of Darkhand. We have another, another 14 GIs in the pipeline which we are going to file now. So a lot of activities in the uh, Northeast uh, we are associated with. I am sure you should associate with them and then try to push forward the IP activities in your region. A lot of potential. Yes, sir, yes, sir, actually, actually, sir, there ought to be a focus on uh, the the users actually poor peasants they have the traditional knowledge traditional uh, the interest is to be protected yes, that has been a, a striving uh, issue and uh, which pe people are not in a position to get uh, the fruits of these intellectual property laws extended to the last uh, poor peasants who have the traditional knowledge and different tribal communities keeping in view of pepsico uh, that uh, what is that uh, uh, chips manufacturing company? Which was uh, suing, uh, yeah. yeah, it was uh, it was suing uh, the poor farmers about the intellectual property violations uh, in Gujarat. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, we need to just try to focus on those poor peasants and their traditional knowledge is to be protected. And in that uh, area, if there if there is uh, support from your end. Uh, I think uh, our Preta and uh, other uh, good friends might uh, take such initiative. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. And by establishing a center for protection of traditional knowledge and the, yes, the, the poor farmers. Yes, sir. That, yeah. That's, that's one, one, one huge area that is. To that's, be what, that's what, yes, sir. Actually, all these uh, uh, Northeast states put together, there ought to be a momentum uh, towards that end. Yes, sir. True, true. That's what true. I, I feel, and I suggest uh, Preta to take initiative and uh, present it to follow follow it up. So definitely, we will be yes. taking the help and assistance of all of you. Sir. Yes, yes, please. I think we can. Uh, we maybe can maybe when, when next time we have that particular expert committee meeting in yes. North East, I'll invite all of you. Sure, sir. Sure. So that you will be yeah. able to interact with those people. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yes, sir. Oh, sir. Uh, thank you once again, sir, for being a part of this session.
for giving time to us out of your busy schedule and for completing the entire concept of trademark, giving a glimpse of entire concept of trademark, each and every aspect of trademark in a very updated manner with the landmark judgments and various decided uh, examples, illustrations, uh, so beautiful ads that you have uh, shown to us. It is, I know that as a faculty of law or any other participant who are there from law background, they know that these subjects, not only for trademark, copyright, patent, and all these IPR subjects, these are not a cup of tea that we can deal with it just for one hour or two hours. We need actually a period of long 12 or minimum 15 to 20 lectures to deal with it. But it is very uh, great to see all of you, all the resource persons, including you, sir, that you have so well dealt with these sessions. And we are not feeling that something has been left outside. Everything has been touched somehow or the other. So with this regard, sir, I just come to the conclusion of this particular technical session. And not only today's technical session, for, but we are also coming to the conclusion of the entire five days program. So we are just uh, thinking of uh, setting up our validatory session. And I am very fortunate that I am seeing all the resource person here in the screen. Uh, and I would also like to now welcome Dr. Gautumi Dr. Bora Mem, uh, principal of Dr. RTP Law College, as well as the chairperson of this uh, five days workshop to deliver her address. Honorable resource persons and uh, more, more specifically, Hori sir, deputy chairperson, co coordinator of IQSs of both the colleges, coordinators of this workshop. So, we are at the end of the uh, end part of the five days national workshop on IPR, and the experience of last five days for Dr. RTV Law College, Kukrajar Law College, and obviously for the participants also, uh, is such that I must say that the experience have indeed been a matter of great uh, honor and privilege to be illuminated on IPR from the very highly distinguished personality throughout the country. In fact, I must say that in normal circumstances, circumstances, it would not be possible on the part of law, uh, law colleges situated 625 kilometers far away from each other and also to be enlightened ourselves from such resourceful delivery in normal circumstances. So I express my sincere gratitude to IQSSL of both the IQSC, uh, IQSCs of both the colleges for organizing such a wonderful program. This program was started with a welcome speech of the Deputy Chairperson, Mrs. Krita Brahmo, Principal Kukrachar Law College, followed by a keynote address by respected Professor Ramesh Barpatra Guhai Sir, Advocate General, Government of Assam. In his speech, uh, he covered the concept of IPR importance for protection of such right. He stated that IPR is a right that encompasses everything uh, created by human intellect. So, uh, uh, so we, uh, everybody should emphasize on the protection of such right from human rights perspective. Then he mentioned that thought process of the people of our country is protected in our constitution in the preamble of our constitution. So he appealed to proceed on, uh, on terms of a constitutional mandate by involving fundamental database research so that bureaucrats may prepare policy on the basis of such data. He emphasized on the transformation of creativity of human intellect towards service of human civilization. Consumer effort for every section of society is necessary for safety human civilization. He concluded his piece with a urge for electing appropriate legislation for protecting the intellectual property in the uh, property of the people of the country. The topic of the first day technical session was concept of IPR and judicial trend, a, pros uh, a prospective. Resource question of the day was Professor Mohan R. Bolla, Principal Krishnu Jayanti College of Law. In his delivery, he mentioned very nicely the basic concept of IPR by stating that 
raising a problem and solving that problem is an intellectual activity and a right acquired by a human being in this process is the intellectual property right is daily in his delivery he mentioned various landmark judgments from the indian judicial system to highlight the judicial trend on ipr in india the topic of the second technical session was uh, traditional knowledge geographical indication and constitution of india issues challenges resource person was dr nilpal deka advocate guwahati high court he covered it three basic concept indigenous knowledge traditional knowledge and geographical indication he stated that something uh, producing necessarily is indigenous knowledge of indigenous people is indigenous knowledge and the recognized indigenous knowledge is traditional knowledge he stated that traditional knowledge may be traditional medicinal knowledge genetic resources such as medicinal resources that uh, derived from flora fauna etc and folklore including folk music geographical indication is a sign on product which indicates geographical in origin as such quality and characteristics of the product due to place of origin such as muga silk of assam darjeeling tree etc and for uh, recognition one have to apply for uh, registration under the geographical indication act he mentioned the provisions under the international documents as well as in domestic law for protection of the uh, geographical indication and uh, urge for an enactment of a legislation for protection of traditional knowledge in upcoming days the second uh, third day session on the an on an overview of patenting system and prohibition for double patenting and the program was enlightened by uh, dr m n bhimesh senior advisor llmt advocates and solicitors bangalore started his delivery very attractively by presenting a video on the harsh artificial intelligence sophia to show the importance of technology he mentioned that nowadays inventions by artificial artificial intelligence are also in queue for registration and uh, uh, for registration he mentioned that thomas at the alpha edition have patent right over 1090 uh, 1030 nine inventions with a beautiful video on yoga he highlighted the importance of protection of those inventions created through yoga in india in his speech he convened he covered various international documents for uh, protection of patent as well as domestic legislation and procedure for uh, protection of such right as well the provisions for double patenting in the fourth day we have enlightened by the resourceful delivery of professor dr srinivasulu ns professor of law national university of judicial science kolkata he said stated that literary work is the beginning of our all other work on which copyright is granted he mentioned that copyright is something different from other intellectual right due to the moral values involved in it and for this reason additional protection of 60 years after death of the right holder is recognized he highlighted on the correlation between media and the literary work on the copyright uh, society which works for protection of copyright and also for the uh, also legal issues related to infringement of copyright copyright the uh, then topic of today's technical session was on a overview of traditional uh, overview of trademark which was highlighted by dr t ramakrishnan professor of law chairperson ipr national law school of india university bangalore in his delivery he mentioned that trademark is a psychological function of human being over a symbol that symbol that is a trademark indicates a distinctive character of that product it is the merchandising shortcut that help the purchaser to select a particular product trademark may be granted on the shape of goods packaging combination of color signature etc he mentioned that generic and trademarks are mutually exclusive he stated on the grounds of absolute and relative uh, uh, relative 
on the grounds absolute and relative for refusal of registration this entire session cover various examples on trademark to make it understandable to the participant the benchmark of the entire five days program is the presence of doctor uh, presence of advocate horish sir who throughout the entire session very actively participated with other resource person and also interact with the participant and thereby enlighten us on various aspects i express my sincere gratitude on behalf of organizing committee to all the resource person advocate horish sir participants to be a part of this program and thereby make it a successful one thank you very much uh, i have learned many things from the program you organized uh, this time this is a five day program and so many issues have been discussed and i am really feeling enriched uh, with as i joined the program okay so good so good to hear the, such very well yes. uh, Uh, narrated words. Okay. Okay. Please. And, yeah. Go Sorry. ahead. Thank Asim. you, Gautam Ma'am, uh, for your note regarding the entire workshop. So, last but not the least, I would like to call upon uh, Ms. Shilpi Gupta, Ma'am, the coordinator of IQAC cell of Dr. IPT Law College, as well as the co-convener of this workshop, to deliver the vote of thanks. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Honorable guests, respected speaker, chairperson, deputy chairperson, members of organizing committee, dear participants. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks speech and acknowledge the contribution of those who worked hard to make this national workshop on intellectual property a grand success. I, Shilpi Gupta, convener of this workshop, on behalf of the entire fraternity. of the organizing committee at a very outset extend my most sincere vote of thanks to our keynote addressee professor rc borpatra gohai advocate general government of assam and former dean law guwahati university who spared time from his busiest schedule to inaugurate this workshop i extend my hearty vote of thanks to all the speakers without whom the workshop would not have been possible our deep sense of appreciation for professor mohan r bollap principal of krishtu jayanti college of law bangalore for his explanation on ipr and judicial trends we are grateful to dr nilutpal deka advocate guwahati high court for demonstrating his idea upon traditional knowledge geographical indications and constitution of india next i like to express my gratitude to dr amn dimesh senior advocate almt advocates and solicitors bangalore for giving an insight upon patenting system and prohibition for double patenting I also like to express our sincere thanks to Professor of Srinivasula as Professor of Law, National University of Juridical Science, Kolkata. Excellent coverage to copyright law in free work. Sincere vote of thanks to Professor T. T. Ramakrishna, Professor of Law and Chair Professor IPR National Law School of India University, Bangalore, giving an oath of trademark. I would like to take an opportunity to place on record my hearty vote of thanks to Chairperson Dr. Gautami Datta Bora and Deputy Chairperson Ms. Preeta Brahma for the logistic support and guidance they have extended to all of us at this workshop. I also extend my vote of thanks to the entire team of organizing committee for their enormous cooperation in the organization of this workshop. last but not the least i extend my hearty vote of thanks to all the participants who have actively and patiently co- participated and cooperated with us and made this workshop a great success once again i thank to everyone for all of your kind cooperation in entire workshop thank you i personally uh, would like to take the opportunity to thank offer my heartfelt thanks to all our uh, speakers for accepting our uh, invitation as an invited speaker within a short period of time and giving us your uh, precious time and uh, devoting us some of your uh, time in uh, in order to transmit the knowledge that you have with regard to ipr and uh, sir uh, ramakrishna sir heartfelt thanks anyway sir thank you and uh, himesh sir thank you i know you are there but maybe due to some network glitch not able to see you and uh, mohan rao sir thank you you made the 
uh, workshop very lively and i have been a fan of your since uh, christ for being so jolly and, <laughs> and lively thank you and thank you very much <laughs> sir harish sir uh, right. meeting you for the first time right. uh, right. we will uh, keep in touch sir with you sure, sir. so nice to see you and it's all because of mohan rao sir to be nice. able to nice. meet nice. and interact with you i know i am thankful to mr mohan bala for this Otherwise, I would have not been probably on this. You, you should only extend your resources, resource support to Preeta to organize. Sure, sure, always, always, always. Yeah. All of, all Thanks, of pleasure, sir. Indeed, pleasure yes. meeting all of you to get yes. to know all of you. So we shall sir. keep in touch. Special appreciation yes, to Mohan Krishna sir also. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Today uh, you join, sir. Thanks to you, Mohan Krishna sir, for yes. joining. On in the end day, uh, Prasenn ji, thank you. You have been a. He was not visible. That's all. Oh. One day also, I was there. I think. He's there. He's there. Mohan Krishna is there. Prasenn ji, thank you for being the moderator throughout the program. Thank you, the co-trainer, chairperson, Gautam Bhi, ma'am, and my colleagues from Kokrajhar Law College. Thank you, all the participants, for joining this workshop. your presence have made it a grand success all thanks to you and your queries have uh, enlightened uh, the concept of others as well uh, thank you for joining all of you sir and if it would have been a you, physical sir. physical workshop we would have been so happier to uh, welcome you with our uh, traditional garlands <laughs> oh. yeah okay okay <laughs> we, we hope to see you sir Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Okay, ending on a pleasant note with grand conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.